and um, I'm also co-chair of the Governor's Workforce Equity and Diversity Council. So I'm kind of speaking from both of these perspectives. And um, I, I, I don't, uh, you're dealing with a really complex bill here, as you're seeing, right? And I, and I don't have, um, I'm not gonna tell you that uh, I'm strongly in favor of this or strongly opposed to this, but I wanna kind of share some thoughts that I've had as we've gone through this process that hopefully might be helpful. So um, I do want to say, to, just broadly speaking, that I think that the, there's tremendous value in taking a systemic approach to looking at racism within state government. And um, I think that uh, Commissioner Festigi made a good point yesterday uh, about the retention level of people of color in state government, that we lose people of color as employees at a much higher rate than we lose white employees. And, and I was glad that she made that point because it's something that the, the council has been trying to pay attention to and that there aren't uh, really obvious reasons for. Um, and so that lends support to the idea that there's something kind of underneath this all that's going on that we really need to take a close look at. It's not just a simple matter of fire this person or change that policy. And, and so, I, so I appreciate that approach and, and uh, that you're trying to do that. Um, I, uh, as a, so just to speak a little bit as a um, co-chair of the Governor's Workforce Equity and Diversity Council, this is a council that, I don't know if you've heard testimony about exactly what this is. Tell us. Okay, so it's, it exists by executive order, and I don't know who started it. It's been around for a while, but um, uh, it's uh, it's kind of like the Equity and Diversity Committee of the state workforce. And so I have been, this is the third time I've been part of such a committee. Um, for At Virginia Technical <coughs> College, when I worked there, I was on their Equity and Diversity Committee. When I worked at Norwich University, I was part of their um, campus climate committee is what they called it. And, and so I, I've had a fair amount of experience with this kind of employer-based group that's uh, trying to provide some advice, trying to provide some recommendations. Um, I will say it's uh, it's been kind of quiet in this since uh, last fall. Uh, and, and I take responsibility for that. There are, um, we have big plans, but getting them into motion is, um, it's hard when you have people who are just kind of doing this as a committee that they're on as part of their regular job. Uh, so I would say that this this council is kind of simultaneously, um, if we're if we're looking at the work that the bill is trying to accomplish, and you compare it to what the council is trying to do, the the council is kind of at the same time too broad and too focused to be able to accomplish what this could do. So we're. Um, we're a little bit too focused in that we work with the Department of Human Resources and we provide input to the Equal Employment Opportunity Plan. And, um, and, that, and we have you know, a, a particular mandate to assist with a report and to assist with that plan every year. And then it's kind of broad in that it's not specifically focused on racism. It's just sort of everything to make this workforce better. And so um, it's not an adequate body to be able to deal with the kinds of issues that this bill is trying to deal with, although it certainly can be a collaborator, it can be part of the picture in doing that. Um, uh, and so then um, I also wanted to talk just a little bit about uh, the structure as you're looking at how to do this. And again, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you which way I think you should do it, but I think you, you're kind of dealing with two choices. You can have this very independent body and uh, staff person who is working on kind of that outside and um, is not subject to political appointment, is not answerable to the governor. And I think that was really the goal of the Senate committee was they wanted it to be very separate. And then the other way to look at it is uh, a state employee who is uh, serving at the pleasure of the governor, who is carrying out the administration's wishes. And I think there's real value in both of those. Um, they both have their pros and their cons. In my experience, doing this kind of work in other places, uh, and, and also doing gender equity work in schools and tech centers, you've got to have a top-down approach. This kind of stuff just doesn't work when it's 
um, not coming from the very top. And it has to be uh, not just the top person hires somebody and says, okay, you got it, or forms a committee and says, okay, you take care of it. Because there's really a tendency to kind of push this stuff off into that group or that person and say, all right, you know, we've, we've got someone who's going to handle it. It has to be an investment that's really coming from the top and, and infuses everything downwards. So, so this is, I think, sort of the challenging place that you're in, is how to make that happen. Um, and I, you know, again, I say there's pros and cons to both ways to do it. If you want to go this kind of independent route, we have a structure built into state government already for an independent body, a commission, a panel, whatever you want to call it, and somebody who works for that group. So we've got the Human Rights Commission, which is this group of people that are all appointed, and they hire the staff who carry out the work, and they're completely independent. The Commission on Women is the same way. We've got this body of 16 commissioners. They're all appointed by different people, not all by the governor. I work for the commission, and we're not answerable to anybody else within state government. We don't have any kind of responsibility or authority that allows us to tell anyone else in state government what to do. And so that's a key difference that you need to kind of sort out. But I would say if you're thinking about doing this independent route, I would encourage you to look at the structures that are already in place um, when it comes to things like posting a job and hiring and supervising and firing. It's it's all there already within the structure of state, the state government. You don't really need to come up with a new, I mean, I notice in here there's something about coming up with a process for removing this, um, this staff person. And I, I don't know that you need something separate and, and new for that. Uh, I also agree with the, the witnesses who've spoken about the title of it. Civil rights, I think, is too broad. I think if you want to address systemic racism, you should say that and you know however however you want to title that but um, I, I would encourage you to, to get that in there because um, I think there's a lot of value to having the title very clearly say what it's for and so there doesn't have to be a lot of explanation about it and then I'll also just um, uh, and maybe this is a question for appropriations but as you're thinking about support Supporting this position long term and you're thinking about funding there's salary and there's per diems for the panel members but then there's also all of the administrative support and the um, infrastructure that comes with that and um, and it, it may be that the administration is perfectly fine with just kind of absorbing all that but um, they may or may not be down the road and a significant portion of our budget goes to things like fee for space and allocated expenses, um, which are, are not absorbed by anybody else. So that may be a consideration for you. So question. <coughs> um, we've got Jessica and Cindy. So we're just talking about the budget for a minute. For the Governor's Commission on Women, is um, so you have an allocation that's in our yearly appropriations, is that right? And then and then you raise money outside of that? Or no? well, we get grants occasionally, but the primary source of our funding is state appropriation. And that's mm -hmm. been now, it's been a long time. Right? We were formed in 1964, um, didn't have much in the way of budget for most of that time. So. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. I was just trying to think a little bit about continuity of the director or the whatever we decide to call the mm -hmm. head person. If they're if they're directly in the cabinet, then they're going to trans. They're going to keep changing, <coughs> and, re, and continuity would seem very important in this sort of work. So you want to keep it sort of a little bit independent because of that, because then you wouldn't have to switch with the governor. Mm -hmm. what do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, I, I think it would be really problematic to have them switch with the governor like all the other cabinet members yeah. do. Uh, and so that might be an argument for an independent panel that hires and supervises its own person. It could also be an argument for creating a position that's not a cabinet position, that's not um, appointed by the governor, but is simply another state employee. Um, it, I mean, you still have the, you still have the danger of kind of 
you know, being separate. Have, yeah, having it not really be incorporated into um, into the administration's priorities. And I'm not sure what you do about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Cindy, I can I didn't fully grasp what you were talking about with what you're doing. Is it around? Uh, Employment equity that you were talking about. Oh, the it governor's doesn't workforce have a name. equity and diversity council. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Okay, I didn't hear the name. Yeah. So that's a that's a council that's formed by executive order. It it includes it's up to fifteen people. Um, several of them are in the executive order are named. So for instance, I'm in there. Um, not me personally, but you know my position. And then there's members of the public, other state employees. It's kind of a, a mixture of, of people. And what are the goals of that group? So that group is um, designed to assist with the Equal Employment Opportunity Plan that the state comes up with every year uh, and provide advice and counsel to the Department of Human Resources, to the commissioner in um, uh, equity and diversity issues related to the workforce. So in the past, we have looked at things like um, the the recruiting process that or the um, the online application process I mean whether that's accessible to people with disabilities uh, we've looked at ways to be more accessible to um, people whose first language is not English um, those are just some of the kinds of things that we've looked okay. at yeah. so it's just people that just like advisory yeah okay thank you yeah Dennis so I think you were here when the attorney from the attorney general's office mm -hmm. was talking about the six concerns he had mm -hmm. around uh, separation of powers, subpoena power, confidentiality, collecting data, and operational priorities and stuff like that. Uh, can you share his his concerns and those since you're dealing with those issues uh, mm -hmm. with with the additional women? and being involved with the diversity council. Can you share some of those? Or? Um, yeah, our, our role is pretty different, though. The, as this bill outlines, it, the, the role they, um, with the subpoena power, they have um, some kind of authority that neither the council nor the commission of women has. So neither one of those groups is in a position of um, being able to demand data or being able to hold anybody else accountable within the state government, and so that's a difference. Um, I'm not an attorney, but um, I've worked with Julio for many years and have great respect for his viewpoint on things, so I would take anything he says very seriously. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Not at this time. Okay, okay. thanks very Thank you very much. much. Karen, sorry. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Karen Richards, Executive Director of the Vermont Human Rights Commission. Um, thank you for having me this morning. Um, I, and I actually appreciated um, the opportunity yesterday to sit through the testimony um, and to have an opportunity to testify today because it actually gave me a chance to kind of sift through a lot of the information that you got yesterday and try to make some sense of it myself without having to do that on the fly, which is always a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> so um, the first thing that I wanted to say was I think that really um, the question this committee has to answer, the, the big you know, question in the room, is um, how do you best effectuate change with regard to, a, to systemic racism in a system where the very institutions that you're trying to affect are all controlled by white people? Right? So one of the things about systemic racism, one of the underlying premises of it is that because of the way that our country has grown up over the years, right, all of our major institutions are controlled and, and the power structure is in the hands of white people. And so if you look at our legislatures at the federal level, at the state levels, you look at who sits on our benches um, in the courts, you look at all of those power structures, all of them are controlled by white people. And so when we start talking about systemic racism, which most white people don't really understand, and quite frankly, 
I've done a pretty deep dive into it, and I can't say that I understand it at the level that a person of color understands it or come anywhere close to that, right? So um, part of it, I think, is trying to figure out how do you get um, into that power structure and allow the people that are experiencing the systemic racism to actually give the input that's necessary to move the to move it forward. So I think that that's kind of an underlying thing that um, underlays everything that I'm going to say. <laughs> um, so um, I know the Attorney General's office raised a bunch of issues around um, uh, possible constitutionality um, of some of the provisions and separation of powers. So um, as Carrie said, um, the Human Rights Commission has a structure that's not dissimilar. I think they were using that structure as sort of the underlying premise for um, S-281. Um, so we have a, um, our, we have five commissioners. They're appointed by the governor to five-year rotating terms. And those commissioners are the people that hire and hopefully don't fire me. Um, and so, and I report to them. Um, I am not subject to removal by the governor. Um, and that's a very important thing with this kind of work. And the reason for that is that this is really hard stuff that this person is going to be doing, right? When you start talking to people about racism, um, the hackles go up, right? and um, people get very defensive. And so to do this work is gonna require somebody who has some major skills in communication um, with people. Um, but it also means that you need to have um, a structure that does not um, allow when those hackles go up for people to um, basically say I'm not I'm not going to participate, right? Because that's going to be people's first reaction. Um, and I think that, that that probably makes you think I'm leaning towards having this be a cabinet level position, but I'm not. And the reason for that is because I think because of how difficult it is to have these conversations, when you start getting that pushback, if you have a governor appointed person in that position, that position, that person is not going to be able to be as effective. Um, as they possibly could be. Could you take a couple of questions right now? Yes, I could. Piece? Okay. We've got yes. Warren and Rob. Okay. I wanted to go back to the, the testimony from uh, the Attorney General's office yesterday. Yep. And the bill, is, as we have it right now, says at least three members shall be persons of color. Yes. And, and he said pretty clearly that that's unconstitutional. Yes. Um, so how do we make sure that we have persons of color well represented, not just one person, but at, at a minimum two, right. or preferably right. three or more. Right. What um, I would suggest is language that says um, either that the panel members need to have, have um, knowledge, extensive knowledge of systemic racism, right? Right. Okay. Uh, or, and or um, something like lived experience with systemic racism. Because if you use those words, lived experience, that's pretty much going to say it either has to be a person of color or maybe it's a um, white parent of a child of color, right, mm -hmm. who has had those experiences. So it could be a variety of different people, but it doesn't say people of color, so it gets around. And I apologize for that, because that was my idea. And the constitutionality of it never <laughs> entered my mind. <laughs> and when Julio called me, I was like, Oh, <laughs> oops, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so um, I, I obviously am not going to advocate for something that's unconstitutional. So, right. Um, okay, well, I, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Just to, to and like, there is language experience. from Act 54 that you could borrow mm -hmm. um, about how that panel was set up. Um, uh, and what concerned me most, frankly, about that testimony was that my um, statute, which does require one person of color to be on my board, um, may not be constitutional, but whatever, no one's raised it so far. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Yeah, on the record here. And, um, so uh, thank you for that yeah. information. And yeah. we've got now Rob and then Jim. Um, a couple, couple questions. One, in, in your deeper dive here, 
Is there any definition of systemic racism that you come across? Is there? I think there's um, probably multiple definitions out there, yeah. um, and it's really just a matter of, I mean, if you wanted to put a definition in, which one of the witnesses suggested, um, that you look at the various definitions and, and just pick one that seems to resonate. Is a fair amount of what you do on the Human Rights Commission, isn't a lot of that already in statute as far as, you know, fair housing and employment and, and that sort of stuff? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you did around NASA's, but it, we've talked a lot about this, um, this issue, but I have yet to hear of any examples of what's going on within our state government that would indicate that we have this issue. Um, I've any specific yeah. that, yeah. that I could, that would help me. Okay. Um, so um, the Human Rights Commission a month or two months ago um, issued a reasonable grounds finding with regard to um, issues related to racial harassment at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. Um, that report is on our website. Um, and what it indicates is very um, pervasive levels of um, inappropriate behavior around issues of race at the VPCH that have been going on for years. Um, the culture of that um, facility at this point in time um, is pretty poison to people of color. And that's one state workplace. Um, I suspect, based on the fact that, as um, Commissioner Fasta G testified yesterday, that we have retention issues with employees of color in the state, that that workplace is not a unique place. And I have heard from people of color who worked in state government that they did not feel welcome, that they were made to feel unwelcome, and that they did not stay because of that. So I think we have culture issues in our agencies. Um, and some of that is just uh, from my experience dealing with these issues at the Human Rights Commission, um, we have this idea that Vermont's a liberal, open state, and most people will tell you I don't have biases. Um, the fact is they do, and the fact is that those biases play out even if they're not aware of that. So there are things called microaggressions that people do towards others that they may not see as being problematic but are heard as a person of color as a problematic statement. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and just so everybody knows, um, I just saw a, a text from Marsha. She's not feeling well, so I encouraged her to stay put. Um, Jim, yes, thank you. Karen, um, first of all, in terms of the Human Rights Commission, um, how is your board appointed now? Is it strictly gubernatorial staggered turns, or is it more like this model where you have the speaker appointing a position and the Senate appointing a position? Um, they're all governor appointments. They're all governor, but so, they're staggered. But they're staggered. And right now, I have um, people on my board because I've had a number of board members that have stayed um, 10 years um, on the board um, that they, they have been appointed by three different governors. So some of them are Douglas appointees, some are um, Shumlin appointees, and, and we've now had an appointee appointment by um, Governor Scott. So similar. <laughs> I guess to what we've had with, say, the, like the lottery board or the liquor board, where um, they're gubernatorial appointees but they're staggered. So it would be unusual to have all one appointed by a current governor unless that governor is there for a while. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think the issue with this really is that for your initial appointments, right, they're all going to be by the same governor, obviously. So. Well, because this is new. Right, because right. this is right. new. You're so, right. okay. yeah. Um, so my other question is related to, you know, I, and again, um, I, I don't know what the right answer is, but, um, you know, when we talk about civil rights and discrimination, I think of your agency, uh, your commission. Um, is there a way it could be uh, either your um, jurisdiction or somehow be broadened or somehow 
Uh, if there is a new person, it sort of you know works in concert with you or reports to you. Uh, I because I do agree. I do think of you as sort of an independent um, voice out there, you know, or watchdog, whatever you want to call yourself. And and I'm just, I guess I. I don't want to set up too many silos, and we don't know even what silo to go to. But if there's a discrimination issue, I know it would be your shop. Um, right. And so I'm just asking whether that makes sense, or whether the Senate really looked at that uh, right. as an option. Yeah. Um, so let me just tell you what our mission is, because uh, okay. that was one of the things I wanted to correct with you. There is this. Um, I don't know what it is, out in the community that all the commission does is investigate complaints of discrimination. Like, And we are an enforcement agency and that is our primary role. However, um, our mission is much broader. So the mission of the Human Rights Commission is to promote full civil and human rights in Vermont. Commission protects people from unlawful discrimination in housing, state government employment, and public accommodations. The commission pursues its mission by enforcing laws, conciliating disputes, educating the public, providing information and referrals, and advancing effective public policies on human and civil rights. So it's it's a pretty broad um, mandate uh, that could conceivably um, encompass work like this. Is that right? in but, statute, what you just read? Um, yes, but not in those words particularly, but okay. yes, all those things are in the statute. Um, and so the Human Rights Commission could do this work. I think that um, the advocacy community for um, whatever reasons, yeah. um, wanted it as a separate entity yeah. outside of the Human Rights Commission. So I, that's I, I appreciate right. that because uh, obviously it would be perhaps more focused. Uh, right. But I, I right. again, I just had that concern with right. setting up all these silos now. Right. And I I do have concerns that um, you have this person as a, as an independent. Um, entity, you have an independent entity, you have this person as the employee of that, whatever you call that, and, and I also echo, please don't call it the civil rights yeah. officer. Um, call whatever you want, but not that. Um, you could just call it the executive director of the, whatever the panel is, which is what Carrie is and what I am, but um, you could okay. also call it the mitigation officer, whatever. Um, but I think that um, what I worry about is that we have these siloed things going on and my commissioners um, actually expressed some concern about that at the last meeting because we do work on systemic racism. I go around the state and train on implicit bias. Um, it's something, it, it is to me, racism and race issues are the major thing that civil rights should be focusing on right now because of all the issues and so it's not like we're not doing anything on that, right? Um, but I also understand the desire to have it be something that is going to be totally focused on that and that it's not going to be being pulled in a bunch of different directions because we obviously protect all kinds of different um, categories of people. That said, I worry that this person is not going to have anyone to run things by or to um, talk to when they have problems or to feel like there's people that have their back. Right, so some relationship with the Human Rights Commission, I think, would be really good because then there's people who are also working on these issues. You're not going to have this um, this entity going off this way while the Human Rights Commission could be doing something over here that's completely inconsistent with that. So I don't know how. I mean, it says in, already in the bill to consult with the Human Rights Commission, but I don't know if there's a way to make that stronger or um, more. Um, Actual, actually structural. <coughs> when you have a complaint that you, uh, or you whatever you're aware, become aware of a situation and you need to take enforcement action, do you have a, a staff attorney? Me. Okay. <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's one of the issues with the Human Rights Commission is my job encompasses all the administrative work supervision of staff, review of complaints, reports, um, reporting to the board and doing the public policy stuff, being over here. I'm also the major litigator and I have to do all okay. the post cases when they come to me. So that, no, that gives us <laughs> maybe, maybe a better appreciation. Uh, uh, so you wear a lot of hats. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, thank you.
They also do the education and outreach primarily. <laughs> so I had a couple of questions. Uh, uh, probably more than five years ago, uh, one of the black uh, uh, state police members uh, left the state police because he felt there was racism and stuff. And, uh, among his uh, other officers, and I'm sure the lieutenant may have a little more background and speak to it later. But uh, it was unfortunate, and I'm sure the attitude and everything has improved without a doubt. Were, were you or the commission involved with that? That one at all? I think there was a lawsuit. and uh, That would have been <coughs> before me. So I could it was probably <coughs> more than five years ago. Yeah, I've only been for five years. Okay. So. I'm not sure. We'll probably hear more. The other thing was, uh, since uh, even if the, the panel is created, created uh, uh, by the legislature, uh, it sounds like because we want people involved in talking that are involved, it seems like two of the five members uh, of the panel, one could come from the Human Rights Commission and one could come from the, the uh, Diversity Council. They would be part of the panel. So we, we want, those are the groups that are involved. These are the ones that know the most about what's going on with this issue. It seems to make sense that, that they would have, be part of that, uh, be part of the panel and, uh, and that, would, that would be helpful. So they're all dealing uh, with the same issues and talk, because they bring experience, they bring uh, all this knowledge uh, together. Yeah, I, that, could be possible. I think the problem with that that I would foresee is that because these are really essentially volunteer um, jobs, um, they get paid their whopping $50 a meeting in their mileage, but essentially they're volunteers. And with the Human Rights Commission, um, depending on what's going on with any at any given meeting, it can be a ton of work. So we could have five cases on, and they could be getting a packet this thick of stuff that they need to read understand um, and digest before the meetings. Um, and so to have even one of them be willing to serve on yet another panel that's got a pretty heavy lift associated with it would <coughs> be a lot to ask. Um, and I, I think you would have trouble getting someone who would be willing to do that. But I appreciate that. Thank you. The idea. Cindy? I was just looking uh, or going to ask you about your staff, how many staff members you have, and do you have a board? So the board is the commissioners. Um, so there are five commissioners. Um, they have uh, rotating five-year terms. At this point in time, um, we have majority minority, so we have three minority members on our commission. Um, the staff consists of myself, an executive staff assistant, and three investigators. And that's it. That's all we got. Thank you. Other questions for Karen? No? Thanks very much. Okay. Actually, I had some more. Oh, um, that, oh that's right. That because we stopped you waiting. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's okay. okay. Sorry. <laughs> Continue, please. Yes, okay. Um, so um, I wanted to re-emphasize that the structure that you're working from already exists, this board and somebody who works for it, right? Um, the transportation board is also set up like that. I believe the labor board's set up like that. So most of your boards where you are um, essentially not regulating state agencies, but being able to kind of tell state agencies what they're going to do, most of them are set up in the structure that you already have created. Um, so um, I don't see if, if the, I wasn't clear yesterday from Julio Thompson's testimony whether he thought that because the appointments to this were from different entities that that was part of what his worry with the separation of powers was. Um, but um, it sounds like the Commission on Women has that structure um, and <clears throat> hasn't, that hasn't been challenged as a separation of powers issue as far as anyone, as far as I know. Um, the other thing that I think threw um, Julio Thompson off a little bit was the references to the cabinet in the bill, but it does not, the bill does not actually say this is a cabinet level member. It says that the cabinet shall cooperate with 
um, and it says that the person shall work with the cabinet, cabinet, but it doesn't say this is a cabinet level position. And then he said it reports to the legislature, which it doesn't report to the legislature. It says it's an executive branch agency. Um, it says that the panel should provide a report to the legislature, which that's a very common thing for, like, I have an annual report that I have to provide to um, the president pro tem of the Senate and to the Speaker of the House. Um, I do that every year. Um, so providing a report in and of itself doesn't mean I'm reporting to the legislature. I'm just telling the legislature what I do, which everybody does. Um, so that, I think those things um, were not as problematic, <coughs> maybe from my perspective, at least, as they appear to be to um, Julio Thompson. Um, and then um, the other issue that um, Commissioner Fastigy brought up was um, that this was going to be a difficult thing for somebody to do from an independent position where they're not, um, you know, at the gov where the governor is not able to really manipulate and how this is happening and how this person is interacting with the various agencies. Um, while it's true that if it were a cabinet level position, the governor and the governor were in there um, saying, okay, everybody's going to work with this person, um, it might go more smoothly. Um, I think the danger with that is that it becomes politicized and um, that you end up with that person either not being able to function in that atmosphere and leaving or the governor not satisfied with how that's working and then they get rid of them and then you don't have the continuity um, that you really need for somebody to get this work done. Um, and I think my understanding is also that as we are working on this bill, the governor is working on an executive order that is basically going to tell the agencies that they need to focus on issues related to race and could certainly tell the agencies through the executive order as these executive orders go and work with this person, whoever it is, to work on these issues, right? Um, so to the extent that those two things are going on, um, <coughs> hopefully in tandem is my understanding, then um, that uh, working relationship could be established. The other thing that happens, so I'm an outsider, right? I don't have any access, direct access to the governor's office and vice versa, which makes it easier for me to do my job. Quite frankly, if I had to worry about issuing a report about the conditions at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, um, and I knew that the governor could terminate my position if he didn't like what I said, um, I would be more hesitant to do my job than I am able to do right now. And I think the same thing needs to be true with this person. This person needs not to be hesitant about um, telling people things they don't want to hear um, and about working that way. But I think, so the way that it has worked in the past or worked with the Shunlin administration was that I had a liaison in the governor's office. So that was his general counsel. Um, Sarah London, and if I had a problem with another agency where we were um, struggling a little bit in how we were working together, which was the case when I first got to the commission, um, I could call Sarah and she would call that commissioner or whoever and she would try to help us work out that problem. And so I think that same structure could work here. You have an outsider, but they have somebody, uh, a point person in the governor's office that they're able to communicate with when they run into problems with agencies so that you don't have to worry about um, whether they're going to subpoena people and whether they're going to you know, drag commissioners in for testimony. So some of that stuff could be adjusted. Um, and then you just have a more collaborative working relationship. But that means that everybody's got to be on board. Um, but that's the reality anyway. If everybody's not on board, this is not going to work, no matter how you structure it. And while you take a breath, yes. Jim has a question that was precipitated by something you just said. So that relationship with the administration, is that um, a, a part of the structure, or was that just an informal <coughs> of how it worked? Um, I'm not sure. So uh, all I know is as soon as I got in my job, I got a call from Sarah saying, okay. hi, I'm your liaison to the office. Um, I have not had anyone tell me that I have that person in the governor's office now. So I don't know whether that is um, something that the Shumlin administration did particularly or whether, um, you know, the, just nobody's gotten in touch um, with me. 
So I don't were, were you in your position um, when Jim Douglas was governor? No. Okay. Okay. So you don't know if you have that same relationship with the, because you haven't been told one or another, but you right. could pick up the phone and talk to the. I leaders. could talk to Robert Appel and see whether Robert Appel remembers whether he had that, but um, I don't. Just, yeah, okay. And Rob? Um, do you have um, much interaction with other state agencies, as in you have um, points of contact? The different agencies all yeah um, so I um, am in regular contact with the Department of Human Resources um, I'm in regular contact with the Attorney General's office um, and then I have contact with other agencies depending on so for example if we have a reasonable grounds finding because we do the state employment cases so if we have a reasonable grounds finding against fish and wildlife which we never have but um, <laughs> if we had one against fish and wildlife um, I would then be through the attorney, the attorney general's office would be representing Fish and Wildlife, but we, I would be working with them. Um, I also did do an initiative um, that Jim was part of actually um, a few years back with um, accessibility at gas stations, and um, the Vermont Grocers Association was involved, but the Agency of Natural Resources, the Department of Agriculture, um, all the agencies that still have, see the stickers. Yes, <laughs> <Some faded. laughs> um, and so any of the agencies that had anything to do with um, regulating gas stations um, worked very collaboratively with us um, on that project. So, um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I think we're good for you to continue unless you've okay. reached your end. Um, let's see. Um, I think that was pretty much all that I, let me just check out my notes. <clears throat> I intended to be more organized than I am, but time runs out. Um, <laughs> and I have to sleep. Um, oh, the confidentiality issues that um, Attorney Thompson raised. Um, our statute has very strict confidentiality provisions in it. Um, it says exactly um, what is public, what's not public. So I think that's something that's easily fixed. You just need to figure out um, how you want to structure it. For example, when we, um, we get some of those records that he mentioned when we're in the course of an investigation. So for example, if we are investigating an inmate's complaint um, at one of the prisons as a public accommodations disability complaint, um, we, have, we can get access to that inmate's file, which the inmate's file is um, protected by statute from being released to the inmate. Our statute says um, the complainant in a case gets to look at anything that we gather, but our statute says if it is within some of these other protect protected areas that um, we have the ability to withhold that and, and the person would have to go to court and with a subpoena and, and try to get the information from us if it's in that protected category. So I think there's ways to structure this that um, would allow the, the entity um, to get the information that they need, but to have it either redacted, um, which is the other way that we do it with employment records, we'll get redacted records from um, or we'll redact them before we pass them on. So there are ways to deal with those issues and the confidentiality and privacy issues that were raised. Um, uh, he also mentioned collection of data regarding race. Um, and I understand the sensitivity of that, but the reality is if you look at the Act 54 report that um, the Human Rights Commission and the Attorney General's Office put out, there was a lot of data in there about race that just came out of various reports of state government. So we're already co collecting this in a lot of places, and there's a lot of data that's already available. What isn't there, as, as Mark Hughes was talking about, is a kind of centralized platform for collecting it so that you, there's like one-stop shopping, right, to go get the data from all of the various agencies. That's a whole nother, and he's, he's a data person, I'm not. So uh, that's a whole nother structure out there. But right now, there is data available from lots of different agencies um, about race and, and how it affects um, things. And I also think whoever's in this job is going to have to go out and really do 
community work, um, talking to people about how people of color, about how these they interact with these systems and where are the pl places where they have problems. Because if you talk to people of color, they'll tell you, oh, well, this agency or that agency, um, I don't feel like I get um, equal treatment there, right? So that would be information that's anecdotal, but it's also information that's useful to know if you're trying to look at the systems within state government. Um, and then, let's see. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention um, that um, was touched on is the econo the whole economic issue and how um, this is helpful from an economic perspective. Um, the other thing that's, what, uh, that I learned when I was writing the Act 54 report is that people of color are the fastest growing demographic in Vermont. Asians are the fastest, um, African Americans after that, and then um, Latinos, Hispanics. So if you're looking at how you beef up your um, workforce, right, and, and if you're having issues within the state workforce around retention of those folks, you're potentially missing out on a whole group of folks that could be adding to your workforce. Um, and so making state government a better, safer place to work, um, just as a starting point, would be helpful for them. An economic standpoint as well. And I think that's all I Jessica. Um, so, when you were talking about the, um, what you were just talking about the community work, you're, are you kind of thinking, I, I immediately thought of, and this might not be the right word, but the day's work, day's pay, that was sort of a needs assessment of how are things going out there for women. And then they put together this whole incredible report, but it was expensive and a pretty amazing, I thought, job of helping us all see where the issues are. Is that sort of what you're thinking? In well, this um, the way this, uh, the Act you know, S 281 is written right now, there's, the, it contemplates that this director, or whatever you call it, would um, maybe hire a consulting firm to look at some of those issues. So that could be part of what the consulting firm does. Or it could be um, while that consulting firm is looking at um, aspects of state government, this person is going around the state and doing just what they call circles, right, of bringing people together to talk about what their experience focus. is with like um, focus groups. Right, focus like groups okay. or whatever. Which, yeah. yeah, a lot of you see that a lot. Um, and then just a totally separate question. Do you at the Human Rights Commission get many concerns about Native Americans? Um, no, we don't get a lot of complaints from, from the Abenaki population. So it might be interesting to, to look at why. What are we doing right in that area, maybe? Right, or, or why aren't they contacting the Human Rights Commission, which could right, be the right. other side of that okay. coin. Right. Yeah, no, that's good to know. Thanks. Warren? <coughs> Just back stepping a little bit to the fastest growing segments of our population. Uh, that's that's valuable information, but if if there's a minority, let's take for example, if there was one Tibetan family in Vermont and one more Tibetan family moved in, that'd be a hundred percent growth. So when you have being we are as white a state as we are, pick a minority, any minority, and it's very easy for them to grow rapidly because they are so few. Um, so I, I always just want to bear, bear that in mind, but yeah, the fastest growing segment of our population because there are so darn right. few. Right. No, but I can say just, you know, anecdotally, I moved here 25 years ago, and it was unusual for me to see anyone of color walking right. around Montpelier, right? right. That right. is not unusual anymore. Right. And it, there are, um, according to the last census data, and I don't, I think this was 2016 <coughs> data, um, there are, are 38,000 people who identify as people of color in the state, and that certainly wasn't true. Wasn't um, true 25 years ago. Certainly wasn't. Yeah. And if I could, Warren, for the record, there are many more than two people of Tibetan origin. No, many I, of I, I knew I was live in my district. I, I, I knew that I was walking on very thin ice when I picked Kenny. <laughs> the entire Tibetan community in Vermont lives in uh, South Burlington uh, and a, a small component over in Burlington. Okay. They don't live in Montpelier. <laughs> I knew I was on. I was using a picking example, any example. 
I mean, I celebrate the fact that these are fast-growing populations, because we need this person <coughs> in our state desperately. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. You've given us, between yourself and Carrie, you've started out with more just a fabulous amount of information. Thank you for the opportunity, and I, I really appreciate very much um, the legislatures and this committee's hard work on this because this is it's an it's an important thing. Thank you. Now, do we have Kate Mosen? Yes, Kate. Okay. And committee, just so you realize, uh, for these three uh, women, we're, we're finishing up on yesterday's yes. list before we start on today's list. Welcome. Thank you. Um, thanks to the chair and vice chair for and the committee for having my testimony today. Um, my name is Kate Logan. I'm the director of programming and policy for Rights and Democracy based in Burlington, Vermont. Um, Rights and Democracy is a member of the Racial Justice Reform Coalition and is committed to considering, on the one hand, the disparate impacts of particular social and economic issues on the basis of race. But on the other hand, also uh, to supporting the efforts of our coalition partners to advance reform initiatives that more directly address the root causes of racial inequality in Vermont. In particular, S-281 is designed to address the root causes of racial inequality. Um, S-281 would create the infrastructure needed to implement the recommendations of the advisory panels convened as a result of Act 54. Um, but rather than review the findings or recommendations of those studies, I'll use my time um, to discuss the reasons why this infrastructure needs to be developed and why the panel's recommendations need to be implemented under the authority of, uh, to use the title uh, from the original draft of S-281, the Systemic Racism Mitigation Oversight and Equity Review Board, which I'll just call the board. <clears throat> um, and, and so, essentially, I'd like to talk about uh, the important work that you can do in establishing this board. Uh, racial injustice in the United States is far more often an effect of stru structural systemic racism rather than personal consciously held racial prejudice. And um, in response to the request for a definition of systemic racism, um, I would define that as composed of intersecting, overlapping, and interdependent institutions, policies, practices, ideas, and behaviors that give an unjust amount of resources, rights, and power to white people while denying them to people of color. Um, so again, more often the effect of systemic racism, racism rather than consciously held racial prejudice. Um, in a state such as Vermont, where overall there is a culture of fairness, a love for equality and freedom, and a distaste for racial prejudice, many white folks may feel alarmed and confused by evidence that Vermont is not that much different than any other place in the post-slavery and post-civil rights era United States. For example, reports on um, racial bias um, in policing, um, the report from the Human Rights Commission, in state systems that came out recently. Um, the data in Act 54 um, report, for example. So how can white folks respond to the diverse identifiable harms that are done to people of color in Vermont when white folks are not racially prejudiced, or at least not consciously so? Why is structural racism so persistent, and what can we do about it? Um, so studies of implicit bias, and I did submit my testimony um, and there is a reference there for you that I think is a helpful overview of the, the topic of implicit bias, um, which is also known as implicit social, co uh, social cognition, helped to reveal uh, the involuntary attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions. Implicit bias can be positive. For example, you may love children, and so you smile when you see a child, and you want to protect children. But implicit bias can also be negative, especially where negative stereotypes influence our response uh, to those who are unlike us. This is especially a threat within relatively homogenous societies, where there's not a high level of integration among historically distinct social or cultural groups. I was lucky to grow up in a place um, in, a, in Chicago 
where people of color were the majority of my peers and where I form my attitudes uh, toward and beliefs about people of color based on living side by side with my friends, witnessing the good and trustworthy testimony of my peers regarding the subtle but devastating presence of bias and structural racism, even within our own melting pot community. This kind of awareness is far less likely to happen organically for the average Vermonter. The board instituted by S-281 will enable, enable progress towards racial equity by combating implicit racial bias and structural racism. The lack of awareness of implicit racial bias and systemic racism is actually part of what it means to be a white person in the United States. We don't have to know about things uh, that impact people of color. Similarly, it's been the burden of non-whites to know that white people see them differently than they see themselves. As early as the 19th century, African American social commentators were aware that white people did not know about black experience. That is, white Americans did not assume nor understand that black experience was fundamentally different than their own. The fact is that stereotypes move in to fill the void when we don't have concrete knowledge about the experiences of those who come from historically distinct groups. Humans are creatures who form opinions about things so we can make decisions about how to act in the world. And as such, there's no such thing as neutrality when it comes to race in the United States. Either one is aware of what race means in the lived experience of people of color, or one is not. And if not, then impl implicit bias can arise, implicit bias that's structured by prejudicial stereotypes, as well as false beliefs that things are not as bad as they really are. In fact, these false beliefs may often seem reasonable. For example, as a white person, I do not exper personally experience the sharp end of systemic racism. In fact, the world seems to welcome my presence and reward my hard work and my talent. <coughs> For the most part, I feel respected and protected within my community, and I do not consciously harbor racial prejudice myself, um, so cannot imagine that I'm doing anything wrong. <clears throat> However, this lack of awareness of the experience of people of color creates two harmful barriers towards systemic change, especially in places where whites are the majority, de majority demographic group. Um, among scholars of social injustice, uh, the term epistemic injustice has become increasingly common. Uh, epistemic injustice refers to the power imbalances that it exist among different social groups when it comes to knowing. It occurs when implicit bias structures one social group's ability to hear and believe members of other social groups when they speak about their experience. These are the two barriers, hearing um, and believing. In the context of race relations in the United States, the inability to hear and be heard by per another person is what call scholars call testimonial injustice. That is, when the hearer gives a deflated level of credibility to a speaker's word. We have all likely experienced a time when someone spoke over us or thought so little of us that the meaning of our words seemed to not register in the least. Um, particularly as a woman, I've had that experience. Um, likewise, the inability to believe and be believed by another person is called hermeneutic injustice. That is when another person's knowledge about the world as they experience it is discounted. It creates a situation in which members of the oppressed group are not given the space to effectively create knowledge about their own experience and then having it ha have the same status as knowledge created by knowledge uh, by other groups. This creates a conundrum. We want to address systemic racism, but white folks in Vermont are likely highly unaware of the lived experiences of people of color in their communities. This means that white folks are more likely to be skeptical of the testimony and knowledge claims that people of color make. This does not mean that we should walk up to the nearest person of color and ask them to educate us on their lived experience. That might be something that a person of color would want to do, but it might also not be. Rather, we must systemically address ignorance of people of color's lived experiences and negative consequences of that by creating educational and training programs and data gathering infrastructure, as well as opening seats of decision-making power to people of color. Only by combating implicit bias and sidestepping involuntarily prejudiced decision-making processes of well-intended white folks will we be able to address systemic racism. And it's precisely this that a permanent board would provide infrastructure around. So Rights and Democracy urges the committee to pass S-281, but to first consider adding to this bill provisions that are found in H-868. <clears throat> 
In particular, H. 868 would allow criminal prosecution for racially biased policing. Um, again, uh, the reference that I gave in my uh, written testimony, uh, Greenwald and Hamilton Krieger, um, does provide some uh, legal basis for um, for H. 868, uh, in particular, uh, allowing for criminal prosecution for racially biased policing. Well, rights and democracy does not support an increase in our prison population. We do support the reconstruction of our society such that racial bias is responded to with appropriate societal consequences, especially those who willingly take on the duty to, to protect and serve the public. Further, um, so basically you need to incentivize the behavior that you want and disincentivize the behavior that you don't want. Um, reward the people who do their job well and, and um, Stop rewarding the people who don't do their job well. Um, further, while testimony of the Attorney General's office has challenged the recommended composition of the board, we do recommend that the committee consider, with the aid of Legislative Council, amending S-281 with language such as can be found in Act 54, for example, that the board be comprised of members, quote, drawn from diverse backgrounds to represent the interests of the communities of color throughout the state who have had experience working to implement racial justice reform, unquote. So that's straight out of Act 54. Um, and that, that's my uh, testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Questions from the committee? Okay. Thank you very much. And we have your testimony posted? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That takes care of yesterday's lesson. <laughs> is, is Anna Stevens with us? No. Lori Valburn? No. Okay. Ingrid Jonas, I know, and I do not see Ingrid, but we do have Gary Scott. <laughs> not as good looking. <laughs> Lieutenant Gary Scott. Yes. Good morning. I'm Lieutenant Gary Scott. Uh, my current role is the Director of Fair and Impartial Policing for the Vermont State Police. Uh, I've been with the State Police for 18 years. My prior role was uh, the Williston Station Commander, and I was also in charge of uh, traffic safety. But most of my career has been in northern Vermont, in Chittenden County, Memorial County, Franklin County area. Uh, as you heard a little bit yesterday from Curtis Reed, the State Police sort of went down this path of uh, Fair and Impartial Policing starting in 2004 and it's sort of grown to where it is today. We have, uh, early on we developed, uh, I guess well, to back up for a second, I'll just talk about what we're doing as an agency and how we've kind of got where we got. Um, we have a fair and impartial policing committee, which is about 20% uh, people of color, 50% male-female ratio. Um, and it's a lot of community outreach trying to determine where, where we're missing the mark, uh, what can we do better, what can we develop in training. So that sort of leads to the point that our command staff uh, has recognized this issue right from the top. So every commander in the state police has gone through some type of uh, implicit bias training. So every state <coughs> commander has to incorporate uh, a fair and impartial policing strategy within their strategic plan that they present to command staff once a year and what type of progress they have made on that. So from right there for every station commander, they're pushing that message out to the troopers on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if you're not aware, we have 300 and just over 300 state troopers. Uh, we cover about 80% uh, of the land mass and about 50% of the population. So we are the primary police agency for the majority of Vermont. Um, we do have 10 barracks throughout the state and headquarters in Waterbury. So how we're trying to t tackle the problem a little bit more recently is through recruiting. We're sending our recruiters out of state to predominantly black universities up and down the East Coast trying to attract candidates to come to Vermont. That's challenging as we all have heard anyways to get young people to want to come to Vermont. Um, so that is, we're getting, we've seen an increase in the applicants. Um, we are not at full staffing. Um, when we do get a person that it, uh, makes it through the testing phase, which is a <coughs> test, uh, uh, physical fitness test, a psychological exam, before they come into an oral board situation, as they're waiting to sit and meet with the oral board, uh, 
interviewers, they are asked on a clipboard what will they will bring in the way of diversity to the state police. A lot of times it's our way of messaging right up front that this is important to us as an agency. They are asked scenario-based questions during the applicant phase of, uh, you know, how they will deal with LGBT issues, uh, people of color issues. So right there, we're getting a gauge of what this candidate can bring to the state police. If they are hired through our process, which is for the state police, it's a three-week, uh, which is known as pre-basic academy, and then there's a 16-week sort of everyone involved academy, locals and everything, and then we take them back for another eight weeks after that for training. So pre-basic academy and post-basic training. During pre-basic, uh, we have about a two-hour block of just talking about implicit bias. And we use a member from uh, Marlboro College. His name is Aton uh, Nazareth Longo. He and myself will do that training and just starting to talk about racial relations and things like that. And start again, just starting to get the conversation going. That phase of the training is very military style. It's a boot camp, so they're lucky if they can, you know. We remember to eat during the day. <laughs> <laughs> so, if they remember to eat during the day, a lot of the times they eat. eat. Yeah, they usually are free. They, they eat very squared up. <laughs> it's, a, it's a situation going on there. But, um, so then during the academy, which every officer in the state, you know, whether you're DMV or fishing game, they have scenario based situ situations that will be part of patrol procedures. So now, Implicit bias training and LGBT issues are, are really incorporated throughout the academy. It will be in motor vehicle law, it will be in criminal law, it will be in patrol procedures. So there's different things brought into that overall that every officer gets. For post-basic training, uh, we again take the troopers back and Mr. Reed and myself again do another full day training where they have taken the Harvard implicit bias test. Um, he has sent out reading material to, to them, and when they meet with us, they, we go over that material, we watch the documentary, the 13th, with them, and it's just sort of a full day of just talking about uh, implicit bias and what that means as you're going into this career in law enforcement and the effect that that can have. Um, so we also have uh, every patrol commander, sh shift sergeant, uh, within the last two years has now twice gone through implicit bias training. We just did all of our sergeants again the last two months of recognizing um, just all the different parts of implicit, explicit bias and privilege and things like that and then how that relates to the people they're supervising. So every new trooper coming on in the last two years has gotten all that training, now their sergeants are having it. We've also designed a program of informal leaders within barracks, the troopers that are sort of designated that will probably get promoted in a few years, they're regarded by their peers, so we sort of uh, give them materials so they can insti instigate lunch table conversations about racial topics that are happening around the country and sort of in that informal, relaxed environment have these conversations and express different viewpoints. And so we're sort of sneakily attacking them in that area also. So that, because that has more power, right? Your peer is talking to you about these things and another person you respect and what their viewpoints are. So every uh, employee now, we have implemented a real-time web-based employee evaluation system. So if a trooper has two or three uh, use of forces, uh, that will pop up on his direct supervisor's email list saying this is the second or third use of force that may have happened in this time period. It allows us again to go back and take a look to see if these were legitimate use of force that, and if there's any issues and concerns that we should now hopefully catch again in a safe gap in there. Um, and that's been fairly successful so far. Um, so that sort of also leads into our uh, internal <coughs> affairs process and complaints. Um, we have on our webpage, right at the top, how to issue a complaint against a state trooper. It's right out front. You can also do it through our Facebook page, Twitter. You can walk in, you can call. So that lends to hopefully a way to have complaints about troopers put right out front. And then everyone is initially assessed and then we'll go into an internal affairs process that meets that sort of criteria. Our, uh, we have a citizens advisory panel uh, for the state police that is appointed by the, uh, the commissioner and we have obviously a commissioner that's a civilian that's appointed by the governor. So the complaint process, internal investigations leads to the commissioner's office um, and then that the citizens advisory panel will review if a case makes it that far what type of discipline should be, go, should be sort of doled out based on our policies and procedures of what the violation may be. So there is a civilian oversight process for us. Um, 
Um, sure. Anything. I've also mentioned that we do have an overall agency strategic plan where fair and impartial policing is listed right on there of what we're doing. <coughs> we are the only state police agency in the country that has a director of fair and impartial policing. Um, so that is, you know, again, that's the, it's a priority to us and what we do. So there is buy-in from the top. Now we've kind of, our thought process is we've hit it from all of our commanders have buy-in. Uh, it's part of the promotion process to get if you want to go for a sergeant's position, you're going to have you're going to get hit with a question about what you are doing in regards to fair and impartial policing. Moving up into lieutenants, so commander positions, that again, um, and that's happening now this week, where every commander is at headquarters talking about their strategic plan and what they're doing within their communities um, for this topic. Um, that also so reach the outreach community outreach aspect. Uh, we do a tremendous amount with that um, community. We have a subcommittee in our fair and impartial policing committee that's talking about how we can do a better job in community outreach. We're going to put out a survey this year for the public that will just be able to tell us how we're doing, so public feedback on how they believe the state police is doing. Um, and uh, working with different groups throughout the state. The traffic stop data collection is something we have welcomed. We voluntarily started collecting data before it was legislative mandate. Uh, there's been a lot of learning and hurdles going through that process. I was part of that process early on of what we were going to capture on the back of the ticket and in not having the foresight to know where it would sort of lead, we've realized we missed a lot of marks there. So the most recent data that uh, Mr. Reed <clears throat> put out yesterday to the committee, you know, it still misses what a passenger, you know, so if we search a car, we're talking about the operator of the car and that's exclusively what is being documented on that ticket. It doesn't take into account what if, if the passenger in that vehicle had any contraband on them. So it's another way we have to try to figure that out. It is captured in a case. So if a police officer stops a car and is, and is going to search the car, a case is generated and there's a narrative written up with that. But that's not, it's not captured on the ticket. So that data never is going to show that type of information on there. But regardless of, you know, hearing from communities of color and their lived experiences about the problems within the state, that's more important to us, not so much of what the data is telling us. How can we do a better job of communicating and making people feel like they've been treated fairly by the state police? So that's really what our mindset is. The data is just a diagnostic tool that will help us sort of guide where we want to go. You know, much like blood pressure, I guess. You get it and then you realize, you know, I can't eat donuts. <laughs> you know, and all of these different things. So where, really, what is the problem and how do we navigate? So that's how we look at when the data comes out. Um, we do have uh, a lot of policies and procedures. We have a fair and impartial policing policy that sort of exceeds uh, some of some of the requirements out there already. Uh, we've had one for quite some time, and it has had public input in how we navigate and came up with that. Um, okay. I'm happy to take some questions. Go ahead. We've got some questions that were just initiated. Sure. By, by yeah. 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 So we've got Jessica, Cindy, Jim, Dennis. So first, thank you for what you've already said. It's amazing. I had no idea that you were all working on this so diligently. And I'm curious, do you know if the, re the local police are um, doing similar? I think you'll see a hit or miss on some agencies. They, it, it comes down to resources. You know, mo the majority of departments in the state are pretty small, five or fewer officers, and then now they're going to delegate and and figure that out with them. So I think that's part of the problem, even for data collection, as they try to go about that. So um, Burlington is doing a pretty good job of it, but I think it's going to be hit or miss through agencies. So do you offer support? To yeah, I, can, I, I do. I go out personally, and uh, earlier this year, I went down to Wilmington, Bennington, and uh, Dover PDs and did a training on data collection, how to do a better job of collecting it, and implicit bias. So it's about a you know, half-day training for them. So the um the other piece of that is when your car is pulled over and there's a decision to search, is that if it sounds like for state police it's always documented so you could go back and look, is that true with local police? Because we ran into a situation in our own family where the car had been essentially destroyed and yet there was no documentation. That yeah, I can't. Happened. I can't. They, they should be. In order to, I mean, there's been criminal law that's been put out there about a case law about when a trooper or a police officer in the state can search and what they need and how to articulate the facts of that. So we require that. We all of our cruisers have video in them also 
Uh, so that is another sort of check for us along the way. But I cannot speak for the local agencies and what they are or not doing. So there's no sort of these are the things you're supposed to do. I mean, there are through <coughs> criminal case law, but it's and then it can be hit or miss of what happens after that. Okay, and then a totally separate question uh, around your recruiting of um, people of color outside of Vermont. Is your how's your turnover in that area once you are able to recruit? Are you are you able to kind of keep them? How is that? It, no, it's it's still a challenge. Uh, we're at the testing phase. The exam uh, the exam at the academy is something that it's going to be moving out to an RFI process right now of some of the issues and concerns that are happening with that. We are seeing people of color uh, probably in the range of fifty percent are not passing the test. Uh, okay, and then. One final sure. on that. I just, because of all the stuff that's been in Vermont Digger, I just received a phone call from a constituent who's a man of color, a person of color, and um, he was interested in applying for a state police position, but said that um, there's a rule that you can have no tattoos. Is that true? That's correct. So that that's a hard one because he it's, said most of his right. It's a, it's a hard one to navigate. I can tell you that it's a constant conversation amongst our command staff about what is an offensive tattoo on someone's arm. You know, if you get pulled over, so one candidate uh, had uh, testicles on his on his forearm because he had overcome testicular cancer. <laughs> So what is offensive, what isn't? So the colonel kind of has to make that decision. So his overall judgment is just no visible tattoos. But okay. it's a challenging. It's we're losing applicants because of what you're gonna, what one person may find offensive another. And so he doesn't really want to go down that road. So he just made a sweeping. So it's visible. Yeah, yeah. just visible. What's yes. that mean? It, so if our shirts come to here, so that can't be below the shirt, it can't be in your neck or face or things like that. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Cindy, you talked about getting <coughs> on a subcommittee. So Excuse me, I couldn't hear it. You, you talked about getting input from a subcommittee. Yeah. So who's on your subcommittee? So the Fair and Impartial Policing Committee, as I said, is about 20% people of color. On the subcommittee, it was about 80% people of color. Curtis Reed's on it, uh, Bruce Wilson from Burlington, um, Aton, uh, has a red and long is on it. Um, I don't remember who else. Uh, Robert Appel was also on it. Uh, Tabitha Moore from NAACP in Rutland was sort of the general makeup of myself. I go to most, most of the sub So community members. Community members, okay, yes. Thank you. Yep. And now we've got Jim and Dennis. Um, how long have you had the uh, fair and impartial panel that evidently were the only ones that do that? The community? Uh, the committee? Yeah. Uh, over 10 plus years. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay. Um, my other question is related to when you do find a case of bias um, and you go through, you have a, at what point does it become criminal <coughs> and who uh, investigates and um, charges the person? So if a call would come in, um, of anything like that, it goes into an internal affairs process, and then from the internal affairs process, if it's going to turn into a criminal investigation, it's handed to the AG's office. If it's going to, but we haven't had any that have turned to that that I'm aware of for okay. a state trooper. But it can become. It could be, yeah. Okay. But anything, any like so, if a trooper is going to be charged with any yeah, crime, I'm, that's I'm, the I'm general. I'm just trying process. to recognize, uh, uh, reconcile with the suggestion uh, previously about um, allowing for a criminal. In the cases of racial bias, and but potentially it's already there. Yes, we would okay. go through our okay. internal process, and yeah. then that is handed over to the AG's office, and the AG's office would do the criminal prosecution. Great. Thank you. Yes. So I don't remember raising my hand, but I. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you said that. I said I right here. Something over here. But that's right. Yeah. Uh, so you heard the question earlier. Yeah, oh, and it was probably closer to 10 years ago. Yeah. So you would have been, I, I'm pretty sure he was a state police. I can think, I, I can't answer intelligently, so I'll, I can, I'm not, I don't think I'll go down there. Because I think I sort of remember, but I don't have okay. facts. So I just wondered, uh, uh, you know, I would have hoped, uh, I can't remember the officer's name, that some of the stuff that you've done, and you've said you've been involved, it's been, Ten years yeah. that you, we've had. We've had fair I wondered if that was one of the outcomes, the creation of all yeah. that. I don't. It's not 
in my known history of it, it's been more external than an internal process. Okay. But he left the state police. I'm not sure. And then he, and then he went to Rutland. I think it's the other way. <laughs> oh, he left Rutland. He left Rutland. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then. But I'm not. Yeah, if that's the case you're thinking, that's yeah, that the one. I know that one. There's a Rutland police officer that came to the Vermont State Police. He was getting uh, yes. harassed. Yes. But I don't have all the facts on that. But he came to the state police. Okay. I had it. Thank you. Any other questions for the lieutenant? Thank you very much. Good. And congratulations to the the whole group. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, yes, I saw Gary. What's the morning? Chloe, what did he tell you? Chloe, I'm on Monday. Okay, beg pardon. Oh. We will at some point soon, I'm sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, actually, Chloe, would you mind if we take a break <coughs> first? No, of course not. Okay, so let's everybody well, I mean, take a break. She's the break. only one left to test on this right now. I mean. Well, um, not everybody in the room who's testified wanted, who wanted to testify to be done so after Chloe. Well then, okay. I, mean, I did I not realize. No, no. Yes, what a moment. I didn't hear that. But I, I <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, good morning. Uh, for the record, I'm Chloe White with the ACLU of Vermont. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all. Um, my testimony is very short. Uh, you know, we we in Vermont, we are we pride ourselves on being. Uh, very fair and open-minded people, and I, I don't think that's untrue. I just think that, that there, uh, you know, we at the ACLU, you think that there, you know, there are layers, and that there's always, uh, you know, whether conscious or unconscious bias, um, and the history of systemic racism, uh, whether through, you know, our fault or the fault of our ancestors, or, uh, you know, it's uh, it pervades our country still. Um, and the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution, uh, both our U.S. Constitution and our <coughs> Constitution, outline this bold vision for our country, a nation in which there is equality for all. Um, but we, uh, this promise has yet to be realized for everyone. We've made so many important gains in legal, political, social, employment, and other areas, but our nation and our state have yet to break free from an intrinsic system of racial injustice. <coughs> systemic racism can be seen throughout Vermont in our communities, our schools, access to employment, housing, healthcare, interactions with law enforcement, our prosecutorial system, and especially in our prisons, where black men are incarcerated at a higher rate than in any other state. Uh, unfortunately, on the national level, at times, progress on civil rights and battling racism uh, can seem to have stalled, if not been rolled back. So here in Vermont, we have the opportunity to buck that trend and to continue to battle systemic racism through enacting S-281. Um, instead of another study committee, um, we can put our money where our mouth is. And with an independent uh, officer to address systemic racism in our state, and a panel comprised of people with experience in combating racial injustice. Uh, there are a few changes we would urge the committee to make with regard to the bill, however. Uh, first, as others have suggested, we think the names of the entities should reflect uh, you know, the, its, its position of battling systemic racism. Uh, you know, we think this, this is something examined by Senate GovOps, and uh, the issue merits the same consideration here. We also urge the committee to amend the bill with the provisions of H868 relating to expanded data collection and policies on use of force. Uh, these additions will help to reveal and mitigate systemic racism in the practices of Vermont law enforcement um, and really continue the work that VSP and others have, have started. Um, you know, I, I do want to, you know, there's been talk about uh, criminalizing racial profiling. Uh, if we at the ACLU are working on a smart justice campaign where we, where we, our goal is to cut the population of our prisons in half. Um, so we would be hesitant about supporting a provision with incarceration as a possible uh, result of, as a possible result. Um, I also think it would be very difficult to prove racial profiling on its own in a criminal case because of the high evidentiary standard. 
in criminal cases. Um, but there's been proposals by the NAACP uh, to, uh, to outlaw racial profiling and to create a private right of action uh, so that you, know, you can go in civil court. In New York, they have a bill pending that I believe would also give the Attorney General power to enforce this sort of law. Um, and we think that is, you know, in any case, we are one of the few states in the nation that doesn't outlaw racial profiling. Um, I think if, you know, if there is racial profiling within a case, of like a use of force case, where that would escalate, as Lieutenant Scott said, then to the Attorney General, I, I think that would be taken into account, but we don't actually have in our laws, I mean, it says racial profiling is, is outlawed. So I think that would be an important step, but uh, basically you would caution against uh, having incarceration be a result of, uh, of any sort of criminal prosecution for that. So we think through this bill and these amendments, we can begin to fully realize the promise of fair and equal treatment for people of color in Vermont, and I would urge you to, to pass this bill. Um, you know, to make the necessary changes, but to, to really pass this bill and, and help, you know, help lead our government into a more fair and equal uh, universe. Questions for Chloe? John. Uh, Chloe, um, one of the amendments you proposed was uh, um, adding language from 868 to, to increase data collection. Mm -hmm. So is it increased data collection or is it centralized? The collection of data. I think it's a little bit of both. I think you're right that it is more of a centralized uh, component as well, which I actually I can see a lot of the benefits of. Um, I think um, I wasn't able to be here yesterday, but I assume Mark talked to you about that. A lot of the data to gather, it, it's very difficult to look at unless you have a uh, a passion for Microsoft Excel and uh, <laughs> the ability to uh, compare and contrast statistics and with the background of statistics. Um, and I think, you know, you all have talked and, you know, you've seen me here on public records. I think one of the things we talked about is accessibility and of public records and management so that it's easier for public to see. And I think that's really important. Um, so we can see, you know, Lieutenant Scott talked a lot about the progress that's been made. I think it's really important for the public to be able to see that and compare it and not have to, you know, take a five-week course in Excel management. Uh, to um, to really read and get down into the data. Okay, so uh, so I'm just I mean we've heard a lot about data. Unfortunately, <coughs> I've heard a lot of specifics about what data we have and what data we don't have. So if, if there's data we don't have, can you give us specific examples of data that we're not collecting? Because I, I understand the centralized centralization issue, but mm -hmm. uh, you know we've heard testimony that there is a lot of data out there. Mm -hmm. It's just maybe sometimes hard to get to. Um, right. So, and so those are two separate sort of issues. Sure. You know, if, if the data exists and it's just mm -hmm. figuring out how to make it more transparent, that's one problem. Another problem is if we don't have the data we need. Right. I think there is. Uh, I think our use of. Uh, I think I, I I can't speak. Uh, to specifics at this moment. I don't want to say something and be incorrect later. Um, it's a fault of mine. Uh, I think our use of force data, um, I, think is, I think it's mentioned in there that it could be improved. Uh, but I think I, I would be happy to get back to you on that, but I don't have uh, specifics other than you know thinking that what's in 868 right now is, is, uh, would be useful. Okay, because I, I mean, I just have an overall concern. Both S two eighty one and and, and eight six eight are a little vague as to exactly what data we are we are attempting to collect here. And, and given that you know some of the data, data may involve um, privacy and confidentiality issues, I think it's it's important that we start tackling exactly what we're attempting to collect. I appreciate that. Thank you. Response. If this is more committee discussion, maybe, but um, I think Karen Richards earlier today did talk to us about the importance of community collection of data, which is would be the other. I, I agree with you that there are two problems, two issues here, and that would be the second, which is that we may need there may be need to be a funding piece that has to do with a needs assessment by talking to the community. Um, it seems. Am I? 
um, referring to that appropriately? Yes. Okay. <laughs> if you could, one or the other of you, for the record, establish what was just communicated. That I just um, checked in with Karen Richards from the civil, from the, uh, yes. To from the Human Rights Commission, Commission, who confirmed what? Who confirmed that yes, it's important that we look into the, uh, uh, do some sort of community needs assessment around this issue. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions for Chloe? Jim? Um, you, I'm not going to suggest this is the same, but inherent in this, and you talked about it earlier, is bias. Um, how do we get at bias, or is there a way to really effectively, I mean, it, it, it's in all walks of life, um, and, and I'm not going to, you know, presuppose that this is any different, this is very serious, and we, and we want to get at it, but how do we, I mean, I have a, again, as an aside, I have a, someone that lives nearby that, you know, as I drive up early in the morning, you know, 6.30, she's on my way here, and she's walking her dog, I wave, she turns the other way because I'm a Republican. I mean, so she has a bias against Republicans. Um, so yeah, that's right. Um, you know, Do you have a sign have on? Swap <laughs> <laughs> communities. Uh, so, uh, how do we, we get that? I mean, in, in a more serious nature, um, you know, there's an article about um, our colleague from here about getting a threat because he voted um, in some, one person's mind um, <coughs> you know, the wrong way on, on a piece of firearm legislation. That's mm -hmm. part of the process. And, right. and, and, but that constituent of his obviously has a bias. Uh, um, I don't know how we get at um, some of the hate in our um, society. Um, I have a 93-year-old father-in-law. He has some biases. Right. You, know, you can't say that, you know. Right. Um, but I don't know. I think that's a wonderful question. I think, um, you know, looking, I think we, we there are different sorts of, of biases. I think um, there is one where, um, you know, I, I have biases against, you know, different things, but there is a bias against, that has been long-standing in America, due to uh, against racial, especially African Americans, but I would say um, other immigrants. Uh, you know, you can go down the line of you know uh, those Asian Americans, um, Jewish people. Uh, you know, the, Ir the, the the no Irish here signs. Mm -hmm. The the problem of racial bias is especially inherent in our society because of our history of slavery and our history of exclusionary laws. Um, and it's something that even with, you know, it, it, we pass lots of laws, but sometimes the law doesn't follow, the law it may not necessarily follow the community or vice versa. I think part of it is, you know, we need to be exposed to different people. <coughs> But it's also, um, you know, so you, you, know, you know someone from a different walk of life, but it's also recogni it's recognizing the problems inherent in a system and thinking about how to fix it. So there was an article recently in the New York Times, a uh, data study came out that showed that no matter your, um, your class, your, so if you come from uh, a very wealthy family or not, that African American students ended up having worse outcomes um, than white students, no matter if they were wealthy African-American students or poor African-American students, and compared to their peers. You know, we, so we see that day. <coughs> then you look at, OK, how do we address that? And I think through that, you know, we, through looking at how to address the inherent uh, problems in our, that, that kind of issue, that kind of systemic, you know, how, how, you know, stomach issue in our society, there's always going to be bias, but how do we not just fix bias, but ensure that people can succeed in life and overcome both systemic racism and become, you know, uh, become members of society, a more equal society. 
And then, you know, through a more equal society, one would hope that, you know, that bias through exposure to different people, through people being on more equal footing, that there would be, you know, a, a lessening of bias. Of course, it's, it's difficult. It's people's, it's people's feelings. And sometimes feelings aren't rational, or they may be rational. You know, you have one bad experience, you know, you all have met me, Jewish person, maybe now you'll hate all the Jews because you met me. <laughs> but uh, no, but I, I, you know, I, but seriously, I think it's, it's difficult to combat, but I think that we can look at, you know, where we do have issues within our system and hope that through addressing these issues that we can combat also the, the personal biases that, that may exist in people. Um, or at least they learn to keep them to themselves and maybe wave at you when you when you leave in the morning. Madam Chair, could I weigh in? This would be Karen Richards. Yes, from the, the Human, Human Rights, Rights Commission. Commission. Um, so I do implicit bias training, and basically, I mean, there's a million ways to approach that, but the approach that I use is basically to do the brain science around bias and to get people to understand that why implicit bias exists and, and how it operates under this, behind the scenes, how it then affects, it's affected by your perceptions of the world, and then how it drives into behavior. And then we talk about systemic institutionalized racism so that people have a frame for, so the, the idea is it's a three-step process to try to work on this. One is you recognize that you have implicit bias. Two, you understand that in order to overcome your implicit bias, you need to take active, conscious steps to overcome it. And so you need to care about why to do that, right? Because uh, you're not going to change your behavior unless you care about why it's important to do that. And then we give strategies for how you can begin to um, uh, uncover those biases for yourself and how you can begin to work on changing yourself. And so. I've trained over a thousand Vermonters on this, and so hopefully that trickles out in other places and it starts to have its own effect over time. But it's not a one and done, you know, like it's something that people have to work on. And I think the other uh, missing problem in our society as a whole is we don't talk about race. We're very reluctant to talk about race, and when we talk about race, um, we don't do it in a way that's productive. And so that's a whole another conversation is how do you begin to have um, conversations around race that bring out these different issues and that respect um, a lot of what Kate was saying around anecdotal um, information from people of color and how as white people we respect what they're saying instead of trying to minimize or you misunderstood what happened there or you, you know, like how are the ways that we can talk about it that better um, bring about better outcomes. And thank you. We've got Warren, Dennis, Jessica. <coughs> okay, so mine, I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm going to end up with a question or not, but when we're thinking about bias, and earlier Karen had mentioned how life in Vermont was very different 25 years ago than it is today. 25 years ago, Vermont was the whitest of the white, and we all think that we're reasonably non-prejudicial in our in our own personal lives but but yet I would posit that every person in the state has certain personal biases that they probably don't express very often um, but we only have to look at the time when it was at least 25 years ago when we had the Irisberg affair mm. um, that brought out a lot of <coughs> very hostile racial prejudices almost immediately. And my oldest and best friend from my childhood uh, is Jewish and remembers very well when his family could not get a hotel or motel room in Vermont. Uh, that was back in the early 50s. And he was, we were actually younger then, but uh, <laughs> about 10 years old, I would think, when that happened for him. And that was, a very hard learned lesson for him back then. Mm -hmm. um, so this, the concept of bias is, is very pervasive. Mm -hmm. um, and having said that, I don't think I have a question, but thank you for letting me say that. But you shared good information, so yeah. thank you. Uh, Dennis, then Jessica. So uh, uh, about 40 years ago, 
GE decided to show this film to all the apprentices. And the apprentices range from right out of high school, 18, to, uh, to people that were 30-ish. They were men and women. Some were veterans, some were not, because they wanted the cross-representation, because the federal government paid half of the salary while they were in the apprentice program. So the University of Denver put out a film, I'm sure it's still out there, called What You Are Now Is Where You Were When. And it was so popular that they updated it and changed it and improved it. What you are now is where you were when. So if you were 15 years old, you had feelings because of the age you were about the Vietnam War or anything else going around you. So your, your father or your grandfather, they felt different. And of course, in the 1970s, a lot of the younger people had long hair. And what came out of that, some of the comments from the apprentices were, uh, I wish my father could see this. He'd understand why I have long hair, or he'd understand why I felt the way I do about things, and it helped the young people understand how their fathers and mothers felt about things too. What you are now is where you were when, and it was very helpful. I, I recommended it to one of the classes I was uh, taking at the time, to the professor, and GE loaned him the movie, so the whole class could see it too. So I saw it twice, and it and it was a real, uh, it was very helpful. And I don't know if it would be helpful, but uh, it would still be relevant. I'm sure of that. Well, How long uh, movie was it? I'd say it was probably an hour. I'd say it was probably an hour. And if you go on the. Uh, John, if you go on the uh, internet, <laughs> <laughs> because you I know have, you're you very have capable. An, it's probably on YouTube. Uh, device, like yeah, but I'm, I'm not turning it down. It's 100% <laughs> <laughs> charged right now. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> later, check some mail or something. Not it's easier to ask John. <laughs> John's been on to be so, he loves this well, John will find out. <laughs> University of Denver. Uh, Jessica? I, um, mine was mostly a statement, too, and a being grateful actually to Jim to bring up the issue because part of, I think a lot of us think about what Jim asked and I've talked a lot to folks in my community about this bill because it's been in the media and I was last weekend in, at a meeting in the town so a lot of folks came up and talked to me about it and my sense, even I've really learned something this week, I mean I hope that I'm, I've never been um, not well, let me explain it more with an example, is that I feel as if a lot of folks feel like they themselves have experienced some sort of discrimination um, or bias and therefore think they know what everyone else must be experiencing because, well, what do you mean? You know, and for example, my daughter is long blonde here, wears it in a ponytail when she runs and feels as if she can only run in certain places because people either whistle at her or slow down and drive right behind her or things like that. So she feels that she's experiencing a bias towards her. If she were running with her tall boyfriend, no one would do that, right? And so I think a lot of people feel, you know, my um, mother talks about being in a, a Catholic Italian and what she dealt with. And so we all sort of have our own little experience and we don't, what, the thing that has really struck me today, even more than yesterday or the, the last time we talked about this, is that this has something also to do with being able to get good grades in school, being able to get into a good college, to move on, to be, to have a good job and move up the rungs. And that's what's different than what maybe my daughter feels when she goes for a run, right? I mean, that's very different and very um, important here, is my sense. Dennis? So, uh, Jim, uh, I get a lot of the same thing in my district. And I go out of my way to be extra nice. Yeah. I would stop some morning and tell her good morning and hope she has a nice day. Because uh, I go out of my way and it drives them crazy. <laughs> Were you talking to Jim? I thought you were talking to Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's good. Oh, sorry. He's good. <laughs> sorry. But it, it, does, uh, it does get their attention and stuff. And, uh, I, I just want to respond to what Representative uh, Brumson said, and I know we're all waiting for a break. Um, 
I think that's that's true. We do, you know, there is that sense that, you know, I know I know what it's like because I've gone through this. And I, I think there is, um, I think at times, you know, uh, there, there's also a kind of thing where people will say, well, I don't understand why you say I'm privileged. You know, I, I grew up very poor, and I faced a lot of discrimination because I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, and, you know, I, I made my way up. You know, I, I did it myself, and, you know, people were terrible to me, so... So, you know, but I did it, why can't you do it? Um, you know, you'll experience things like that. And I think, you know, that's a very important experience and it's not something to discount and it's something to be celebrated. But I think that through, um, one of the reasons why this board is so, why this board is legislation and, and recognizing systemic, systemic racism is so important is that for, let's say, um, you know, the difference between a poor white person and a poor African American person is that there is this long history of systemic racism against African Americans and unconscious bias. So, um, kids, African American kids, you know, when you have, for instance, like police officers in school, they're more likely to be disciplined, be sus suspended, uh, to be expelled, even though they don't, you know, commit. There's, they don't, you know, commit. Um, I don't want to say commit a crime because a lot of times it's a discipline thing, but they don't commit discipline, disciplinary infractions at a higher rate than white kids. Um, they may not have the same support system that uh, that other kids have. Um, you know, when you when you cross the street at night uh, and you you know unconsciously clutch your purse if you see um, you know an African American man behind you versus a white man, <coughs> that is so. There's there's this long history of you know of of keeping of trying to keep one portion of the population down, um, you know, whether it's conscious or unconscious or now as a result of actual conscious biases. So I think it's, it's so important here to recognize both that the experiences that people have are so valid and that, you know, I, God, I can't imagine, like, you know, the difference between running by yourself and running with your boyfriend is just, uh but you know, and and that also that this is an area where there's been such long-standing um, I, 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 systemic discrimination against people, um, whether conscious or unconscious. That th this is something where we need special mitigation, where we can we can work on special mitigation and address this um, um, without you know not discounting other people's experiences. But I think that's it's why it's so important. Thank you. Any other? Questions or comments from committee members? Then let's take a break and why don't we come back together in say 10 minutes? Does that work, Dennis? 10 minutes? Yeah, no, sure. Which gets us sure. to sure. 25. Sure. It's a documentary. Okay, gets us to 25 of. You find it? 10, 10, 10 minutes. minutes. I, I can judge. And 10, what 10 I'd minutes. like to do um, is spend some time as a committee. Bryn, can you hang in with us? Okay. With Bryn's uh, uh, participation, I, I'd like us to, to talk as a committee about S-281 uh, based on what we've gleaned so far. Okay? So, go no, forth and break. So, so. Um, we've heard from everybody that... <coughs> was scheduled and who has appeared so far. We did get word that one person who contacted us late yesterday needed to change to next week. Um, when we take this up again, I think it's, uh, I think it's Tuesday afternoon. Um, but also, I can't remember if I mentioned yeah, Tuesday. No, Wednesday, Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning, we'll take this up again. Um, and this afternoon, right? Remember from 3 to 4? Oh, oh, yes, yeah, that's this, this afternoon. Yeah. But I meant with, with we, we do have at 4 o'clock two people okay. scheduled to testify this afternoon. Okay. Yes. Um, but there's also a list. Uh, Representative O'Sullivan from Burlington told me that uh, a gentleman by the name of Patrick Brown, who's very much involved in equity issues over in Burlington, that he had a list of folks that we should hear from, and I asked her uh, yesterday to provide me, maybe it was the day before, I don't know, but 
not today. I asked her to please get that list for me so that we could make contact, and I reminded her again this morning. So those folks hopefully will get in on Wednesday next. All right, so there's that still out there um, by way of testimony. Now, after yesterday's testimony, uh, John, you went and had a conversation with Bryn? Yes, I did. About if we could start with these questions of the, the six points, yeah. which well, that's kind what I of, discussed with her. That's right, which kind of put a chill in the air, shall we say, <laughs> yesterday. And I, again, I can't remember if I mentioned to the whole committee, I did ask um, Julio Thompson, the, the assistant AG, to send us in writing a, a memo overviewing his six concerns so that we had that that could post on our website and that we'd have it in his words to be able to refer to. All righty. But so, John, <coughs> Bryn, Bryn and John, however you could share with us what. Well, I basically just went through the six issues that, the, uh, that Julio Thompson raised with us. And, and I, so I think Bryn would be the best person to, to respond. I mean, some of them she was aware of um, beforehand. They actually came up during Senate GovOps. Um, uh -huh. So um, they weren't a total surprise. Uh, so, but she's I think has the most knowledge to speak to those issues. I was just sort of <coughs> the messenger because okay. I thought it was important to hear from legislative council about these issues. Thank you, John. So, Greg, what can you tell us? Sure. So, for the record, Bryn here from legislative council. Um, I'm not sure if I have the, the six points identified, all of them, but I can generally respond to, um, oh, that's good. Right <laughs> okay, so, but, but I'll, I'll go ahead and generally respond, and if there's things that I missed, please feel free to ask me about them. Um, I think that the first question that came up was the question about the panel membership, about the requirements that three members of the panel be people of color. Um, this did come up in the Senate. Um, and I think, as you know, there was a floor amendment introduced by Senator Brock to um, address to change that quota to, I think the language was that it would be a requirement that the panel be racially diverse instead of the actual quota requirement that there be three people of color. Um, so I um, would agree with, um, with Julio that quotas tend to be sort of a crude way of um, achieving a state interest. Um, and there is other language that is more narrowly tailored to achieve the state's interest. But I think that it's important to identify what the actual state interest is. So I'm just going to remind everybody, I'm sure you all know this, that um, when a classification is based on race, the court undertakes a supreme, uh, um, an equal protection analysis that's called a strict scrutiny analysis. And that analysis um, is that the law has to be narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling government interest. So I believe that um, Julio was talking about some jurisprudence from the 80s and 90s that was uh, cases involving um, a state's interest in remedying historical discrimination. So for example, affirmative action cases or state contract cases where there was a program established by a law that would um, make it easier for um, state contracts to be gotten by people of color, I believe. Um, so really the interest in those situations was remedying historical discrimination. That was the compelling interest on behalf of the state. So um, I see, I think that the <coughs> Senate contemplated a different, a different interest in this case, which is that, as you've talked about all morning, um, remedying institutional bias. Um, there may be some compelling interest in having actual people of color who've experienced this bias to um, be responsible for overseeing uh, the identification of this bias or um, working to, a, to remediate that bias. So that's a different interest than the state saying, we're going to put these three people of color on the board because historically people of color haven't been appointed to boards. It's, a, it's quite a different interest. And um, it would probably be a new question for the court whether or not um, that's a compelling interest for the state. The second question of whether or not it's narrowly tailored um, to achieve that interest is a separate question. And as I mentioned earlier, historically, quotas have found to be um, not narrowly tailored. There are other ways uh, to achieve an interest without imparting a quota. So um, I would agree on that point. 
but I do think that this is a this would be a unique question for the court in terms of the interest of, behind the legislation. And do you have thoughts about the language that was suggested this morning? The so that would be language from Act Fifty Four. Um, yes, I think that would be that, that it's similar to the to the language in the bill here. So I think it meshes pretty well. Um, that is one way to achieve something similar, perhaps, um, without using a quota. Oh, sorry. So if we were to say, pass it the way it's written, is it worth the test in court for this, or shouldn't we be making an effort to fix it before it's put into law? And then is left to the, um, a challenge in court, right? That I mean, I think that, that that's up to that's up to the policymakers to decide whether or not. Because I, I think all too often we pass things that with the attitude, oh well, we'll just defend it later. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the right way to do it. I think we should be making laws that can pass the smell test and would not put it out there so that it's challenged later. So. I would say we need to, we definitely need to fix this. Okay, thank you, Patty, for continuing to speak for a minute. I was sort of like, <laughs> thinking, oh dear me. Um, I agree yes. with Patty, that was my point. I, I think that, why, this bill is going to cost money no matter what, and I'd rather be putting the state's money into understanding the issues and getting on top of, you know, making a difference than on spending it to defend the law in court. So let's try and make it as, uh, I hate to say, as good as we can. It sounds funny, but that's essentially what I would agree. Dennis? That's strong. So uh, right from the beginning, I kind of wonder why a, uh, another panel, another thing is being created and stuff. The cost is a concern too, but there's uh, groups out there watching this and I'm not saying that the state couldn't do a better job of uh, doing things. But looking at 868, which I haven't read all the way through and I don't think the committee has gone <coughs> all the way through the way we did. We have not touched it but at all. In looking at this, uh, it says, uh, number one, it pr proposed to prohibit racial profiling. But number five is the interesting part. Expand the jurisdiction of the Human Rights Commission to include managing collection and data and all that other stuff. And those are the things I'm interested in doing, uh, whether it's the, uh, the council or the uh, commission, expanding, allowing, you know, they certainly can do the things they want to do, and, and if they need it in statute, that we expand uh, you know their jurisdiction or what they're doing. I'm more interested, I think, in going from that place than than creating another whole uh, group that's involved with the same type of issues and you know spending money. I mean, a lot more money. Spending maybe some money to to help with the, with the existing ones is one thing, and creating another one where we have uh, six six issues that we're talking about now. Just in S uh, S two eighty one. Yeah. Can, can we just go back to responding to the and, and say the committee conversation? I think you know Dennis brings up some good points, and I may fine, have some. fine by me. Okay, I just. I'm on I the think, six I points. Think, I yeah. think Dennis was, Sorry. I could have been interpreting an act, yeah. I think Dennis was basically saying, why spend time talking about panel composition? Yeah. Why not so just that's why I was talking about okay. I'm sorry. I, I'm I thought that's, but that if, if we could, if we stay with a separate panel, mm -hmm. how does the committee feel about using the language similar to what was in Act 54? to talk about the composition, mm -hmm. as opposed to doing the quota thing. Right. Yeah. We're OK mm -hmm. with that? Any objection if we stick with the separate panel? If we're going to do the panel, then you, we ought to do it right. I'm not convinced we're going to do <coughs> yeah, uh, so I'm with a separate panel yet, but, but given that. that I think yeah. that's how I tried to phrase it. Yeah. So <laughs> can you phrase that again? I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I didn't hear you. If, if we maintain 
a separate panel, such as this proposed in 281, uh, yes, 2S281. Yeah. Are we, as a committee, okay with using language to define the composition of the panel, similar to that used in Act 54, as opposed to um, a, a statement of quota? Mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm, I'm a little unclear on the question you're asking here. So you're, you're looking for support of the makeup of the panel? No, I'm not asking for support for anything. Well, uh, I'm, I'm simply asking the question as to where the committee is. Uh, because it was suggested yesterday that to go with a quota is not going to fly. Correct. And Patty spoke to that. I mean, that we could leave it in there and wait for the courts to challenge it, and there's more money doing a right. you know, right. court challenge thing. Jessica spoke to why Changing put the it. money into a court case mm -hmm. when we have had suggestions as to language that would avoid the constitutional question. Language which is not, make sure I'm understanding this correctly, the language that was used for composition purposes in Act 54 is not constitutionally uh, uh, challenged. Yeah. It's not likely to be challenged from a constitutional perspective. I think that it would be much um, more difficult to survive a challenge if it was challenged. I, I think that a challenge in the first place is unlikely because this we're not talking we're not talking about a um, we're talking about a, a an appointment. So a person would have to have standing to challenge this uh, have standing to challenge the law. So it would have to be a person who could prove that, but for the requirement right. in the legislation, they could have they would have been appointed. Yeah. Um, but yes, I would agree that the language in Act 54 is more likely to survive the challenge if it was challenged. So all I'm looking for is if we maintain the approach that's outlined in 281, which establishes a new panel to deal with systemic racism in our state government. If we maintain a separate panel, as opposed to giving that task to something that already exists, are we okay with putting in the Act 54 language to describe composition, as opposed to having that little statement about there shall be this quota, when we have been told having a quota is, is pretty weak from a constitutional perspective? So I will end I'll, up in court. I'll reserve judgment at this point. We'll go forward. Okay. So we don't have. Uh, we'll we'll just put that question still in the bay. Okay. So then, Dennis raised the question: Do we want a separate panel at all, based on what we've heard so far? Thoughts from the committee. Uh, and we did hear from the Human Rights Commission ED that you could do this if tasked with doing it, or not so much? <coughs> or Karen Richards well, from the Human Rights that. Commission. We could do it <coughs> with additional resources. We cannot do this with existing resources. Okay. <coughs> uh, thank you. John? Yes. That was your hand, wasn't it? Yes, it was. <laughs> So, I mean, I think if we're, we're going to go down that path, we need to understand exactly what the Human Rights Commission does and what we think that this panel should be doing. Um, I th thought we heard a lot of testimony yesterday, um, both, and I think that the most important testimony we heard was from Curtis Reed, um, Diana Wall, and Beth Fastigi about, and I think they had fairly similar visions as to how they, they thought this panel could help. Um, which is, is to take it out of a sort of investigatory um, role and more into a collaborative role with the administration um, in trying to identify best practices with respect to how to combat systemic racism um, in state government. Um, so the question to me would be is the HRC, if, if that is, is what we're trying to achieve, and that's a question for the entire committee, if that's what we're trying to achieve, is the HRC the best landing place for that objective? Um, if our goal, on the other hand, is to conduct investigations of state government, um, you know, and I, I'm getting to the issue with the subpoena language that's in there, um, and um, while we might not be bringing, um, well, it's unclear what we would do with the subpoenaed information um, to some extent, you know, but if it's more of an investigatory role, you know, 
then that's another option. Personally, I think having a collaborative role with the administration and, and trying to solve these problems, um, I think is very important. I think that's what Stiggy's testimony about that um, is very, I thought it was, it was very important. I mean, creating some stovepipe organization that doesn't report to the governor at all, um, doesn't really have any connection to the governor or the administration in any way, is not gonna lead to success. Especially if what we're trying to do is work with state agencies um, to address this issue, identify best practices that are out there. We heard from the Vermont State Police today um, about what they're doing. Um, and I think being looking at those models and ensuring that those models are, are known to other state agencies um, and that there's an encouragement through you know the performance process uh, of implementing them in other state agencies is a far better way to go about this than conducting investigations. Uh, so now we've got Dennis, Jim, and Jessica. So looking, getting back to the six issues that were brought up, and I'm not sure if, if they all, you know, need to come out, but I'm looking at the six issues coming out of 281, and there's not much left of 281. If, if all of them are addressed, and legitimate, uh, there's not much. That's why maybe there's some pieces that could go into the uh, expansion of the Human Rights Commission. That John, that's why I mentioned those things because I I saw a lot of things, a lot of things taken out of S two eighty one from the Assistant Attorney General. Maybe it would be help, <coughs> helpful after we hear from Jim and Jessica. If, Brynn, if you could share with us if you had identified others among the six that had fixes, as opposed to are just assuming that they're unfixable. Sure. Okay. So let's hear from Jim and Jessica, and then back to Brynn, please. I think John highlighted the two issues, and I would totally agree. I, uh, I respect the work that the uh, Human Rights Commission does, and I think it has an important role. And if we're looking for, we got some problems, we got to fix them, and, and, and not the collaborative, but um, here's the sounding board and here's the investigation, then I think the Human Rights Commission needs to be beefed up to be able to tackle that. If we want to give a more collaborative approach, um, a try, it doesn't mean that the legislature can't come back and revisit this next year, year after, and say, how is our progress? I thought I also heard from Beth yesterday uh, some reference to uh, they could do something by executive order in terms of setting up an advisory collaborative uh, board or commission. Did I hear that um, when she testified? Um, uh, so it may be worth an, uh, another conversation with her or someone from the administration as to um, whether or not they um, are planning to do something, uh, whether they'd be willing to do something, or whether they would rather have us put something in statute to, um, if we're going to go the collaborative uh, way. She also spoke to, to check my notes mm -hmm. um, for another meeting I had yesterday on this. She also said, I, I, I don't recall yeah. that this, what I'd have to remind you about the executive order concept, but she did say, uh, she did speak to uh, an interest in a model similar to as far as putting things together. Um, the, the model that we have for the Secretary of Education, where in that instance, it's the State Board of Education that comes up with a certain number of potential people to be their, the secretary of education in that, and the governor picks from that list. She did mention that kind of approach to setting up something similar to what's in 281. Right, I, I, I think we need to um, have some further conversation to find out what they might be. <coughs> willing to do in that area to hopefully get to a place where, um, you know, everybody's can, can live with the outcome. Um, it, it sounded to me, it didn't like a person within state government uh, that 
didn't report to ultimately in some line of authority with the chief executive. Um, and, and again, that gets back to the way John articulated it. Um, do we want the investigative uh, approach, in which case we can do something and set up some kind of structure within Human Rights Commission, or do we want to try a collaborative approach, in which case we need to work with the administration to make sure that that all works. So long as we, for sure, as the legislature, remember that we have to do our due diligence. Oh, uh, 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 but at the end of the day, we have to um, come to terms. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Jessica, or so I just want to go oh. back to the um, what um, John said and what we heard from Karen earlier. So we keep referring to the Human Rights Commission as only an investigative arm, and I feel that one of the things that we really heard about was what is their mission. Their mission is much broader, but unfortunately, they don't have very much, very many resources or staff in order to accomplish that broader well, they have a staff um, mission. Yeah, who does everything. Um, but so my point is that I don't think we should just. For, for again, um, totally cut off um, Dennis's idea of maybe really looking at the Human Rights Commission as also a collaborative, could possibly be a collaborative arm, and except they need more resources. And no matter where we do this, resources are going to be a huge question. And that brings me to the, um, the money again, is that I'm just thinking that the nice thing about the Human Rights Commission is it's already set up. And so the resources, the support, it's obvious what's necessary because they're already doing a lot of the function. And they understand what isn't being done, so can speak to that. I keep thinking about the poor guy from the Ethics Commission who came in and talked to us about what's happening for him. And it's he's still scratching his head about how am I going to accomplish all this all by myself. And also, I liked the idea. I love the collaborative approach, and but I liked what Karen from Human Rights Commission said to us about the liaison role that she did establish with um, Governor Shumlin's administration, whereas we had, you know, our current governor, maybe just because he doesn't think of it, but to reach out. And so it would be nice that that was more, um, in statute or in the law that says that this liaison role is very important and should be connected with the legal counsel for the governor. And that would be that connection. And I, I'm just not sure that the, um, that the current Human Rights Commission has, would have the capacity as volunteers to take on yet another role. So that I think we have a lot more talking to do about that, but I do think that Connecting it is important. Otherwise, we end up with all these, these um, what is it called? Silos. silos. Too many silos. And then we all know how busy our days get. How often we're able to really connect, I think, is about being able to walk down the hallway and connect. And so, um, anyway, those are a few things that I'm thinking. <laughs> Got Warren and Cindy. I'm not confident that I remember Beth's words accurately from yesterday, but I thought she said something about uh, a lot of this the governor could do by executive order, but if he did it that way, it would confine the range of things that this panel could do to dealing only with the executive branch. Did I hear that right? Or did I, am I right? <coughs> I'm looking. You keep talking. Yep, no, you're right. You found it? Yeah. Yep. So if we, we, if that would be a reason not to let it happen just by executive order, I guess, because we'd want the broadest range for this panel. But but isn't the charge in S two eighty one really aimed at the executive branch, with the exception of uh, watching legislation? No, it applies to both the general assembly and the judiciary. Yeah. Okay. I forgot about judiciary. Okay. Mm -hmm. Set Warren? Yep. City? Mine is, is similar. How how does the Women's Commission come into being? 
is, is that an executive order? That was created by an executive order um, originally, and then okay. legislation um, was drafted it. later to change it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to change it to what? What is it considered out there? So it's a it's a independent agency. Uh, independent agency. Could uh, so couldn't this be similar? Or would it, it would have to start with an executive order? Or seeing how we're the legislature, can't we set it up as an independent agency yes. similarly? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I remember some history on, on that when, when the commission was first created, it was the governor's commission on oh, women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then yeah. there was a, a point in time where it then went to being the Vermont Commission on Women, and that gave it much greater independence. I think it went from an executive order to a bill, and then yeah. changed it from the governor's commission to the Vermont yeah. commission, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that change was allowed only if we didn't let them have any per diems. <laughs> well, that's the oh, that? Yes. Did, did, did John hear that? Did the per diem. Well, it's when it was changed from the Governor's Commission on Women to the Vermont Commission on Women. They, they did gain quite a bit of independence, but that was the moment when it was put into statute that the commissioners could not be paid a per diem. Yeah. So we just fixed that. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. It only took how many years? Yeah. Uh, okay, Rob. I, um, I have some major concerns <coughs> over this commission and the way that it's being tailored in that I think it's way too independent. And this person that would be named the chief or whatever, um, you know, we heard a couple different presentations yesterday that were very different in style <coughs> and my concern would be is that you know if you get the wrong person in there that it becomes an activist as opposed to just really going through and trying to address issues that I think there's more general support that needs some work on and I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned that the way that this would be set up is that there there's just no accountability um, you, you have a board that is elected by all sorts of different entities, and this particular position is reportable just to that board. Um, so I, I'm very, very concerned about that sort of setup. Well, that sort of brings us to the second issue, which yes, sort of addresses gonna, that. I was going to ask if we were all set to go back to Bryn. Mm -hmm. Okay, good segment. <laughs> So I think that the second um, point that um, Attorney Thompson raised was about the separation of powers issue. Um, I would just remind the committee that separation of powers question is not whether one branch of government is exercising the cer certain powers belonging to another branch of government, but whether that power exercise so encroaches on another branch of government as to usurp um, that branch from its constitutionally recognized um, functions. So um, I would just point out that the jurisdiction of the chief um, is to identify systemic racism in government, and it's not to administer control over other branches of government or um, discipl have exercise disciplinary authority. Um, there are multiple examples of agency-level boards that you've created that are vested with regulatory or quasi-judicial um, functions such as the Ethics Commission and the Transportation Board. Um, those boards are structured similar, similarly to this one. The Ethics Commission, for example, has an executive director that serves at the pleasure of the commission. Um, so this is something you, that you have done before. Um, and I understand that there are some people who might not, might not like it, but it is something that you've done, and I don't believe that there is a separation of powers issue. I understand that um, there was might have been a misunderstanding about the whether or not this was a cabinet position, but I would just draw your attention to page two, which says that the chief civil rights officer should have the powers and duties um, of the cabinet, but shall operate independently of the cabinet. So it is not a cabinet position specifically. Um, the officer shall not be attached to any state department or agency. So um, I think that there may have been some confusion about whether this was actually a cabinet level position that didn't report to the governor, but it actually is an independent 
position in that regard. All set. That's, that's it? Okay. So just if I could, Dennis, and then John. Oh, sorry. So <laughs> the, uh, my note here, and I can't remember now if it was the Attorney General, the Assistant Attorney General, or if it was uh, HR. Uh, it ties the, uh, this, there's a state's obligation is to work with the panel, and that was a concern. And I can't remember now if it was the Assistant Attorney General who made the comment that this would, this puts a state obligation, but it sounds more like that, doesn't it, in HR? But that was one of the notes I had, that it requires them to work with the panel when, uh, when the administration and uh, you know is a you know they work with everybody, but uh, I, I think uh, the mandate was a con was a concern. Uh, and I don't know if that's page two or three. I didn't page two should be on page two. Oh, uh, number three should be attached to the state department, not be attached. But so be housed with them. So I think it was C is uh, what she was uh, referring to. Right. So that is a. I mean, that would be a, that's a policy question whether or not you want to house the position within the agency. There are other examples. I think the Commission on Women was given funding to have its own support staff. Um, so that may have been a decision made in the Senate to avoid that kind of funding for the position, I'm not sure, but um, in that. Jessica? So it, for me, B and C both lend or lead you to believe that it is part of the cabinet, but not part of the cabinet. And that, I just think if nothing else, if we continue to go with this bill, we should re, re board that or rewrite that or whatever, just to make it really clear, because I, I agree, I, I agree what you're saying, Bryn, that that's not what it said, and I realized that yesterday, but I still feel like with all the language around cabinet, we did not do that with the ethics group, and I think that that's important to be clear, and this isn't very clear. It makes it seem like maybe all of these things, administrative, legal, and technical support is going to be exactly the same as if you were a secretary of commerce, and that you're going to have the same kind of support. and. Um, uh, so I understand why the Attorney General um, said what he said. I think it's confusing and we need to be really careful because this is such an important spot that we have to be careful. <coughs> Did you have your... I thought you were down here again. No, oh, yes. no. No. Other thoughts with regard to the separation of powers issue? Which is <coughs> related to the... Um, panel issue. You know, make it a separate panel. Or the assistant NG came and asked to speak with the ED and the human rights commission about the ball. That's who you're looking for, yes? <laughs> Thank you. Nothing else on that topic for the moment? Um, for the moment. John? Uh, I'm just Looking at Beth Castigi's testimony. Um, <laughs> we saw it coming, John. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there's a number of ways we could structurally change um, both the panel um, and, and the chief um, civil rights officer's reporting functions. Um, it, and again, I, I think it comes back to exactly what the heck we want this panel to do. Um, you know. I, I personally believe in a collaborative approach with the administration, um, and you know I think if that's the way we we go, um, you know the, the governor I think needs to have a little more say in, in with respect to um, the the chief officer, um, and you know there's a couple models that we discussed that I discussed with Bryn this morning. Um, that could do it, you know, and I think one's the agency of education model um, where you do have a, a board who makes recommendations to the governor, three recommendations, I believe, the uh, and, then the, and the governor chooses. So he has one, one person, right? He appoints one of the five. Well, that's how it's currently structured. I mean. um, we could go to the state board of education, which I believe is totally appointed by the governor. Um, so there's different ways 
we have the ability to structure things in different ways um, uh, to ensure that there is a collaborative approach between the, the officer um, and the administration. Um, so I, I think, you know, that that can be worked out. Um, I, I, I mean, so I mean, you know, I'll, I'm very open to that. And was there another model? You said, well, there's the, the transportation models. board, which I have, yes. we, we briefly touched on, but I have not looked at it. I mean, yeah. you may be able to provide more. I haven't had the to look at that yet either, but I will look at it, certainly. Since the transportation board has been mentioned a couple of times yes. by a couple of different yes. people. Yes. No, it came up in discussions this morning. Yes. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, so we have the ability, the flexibility to, to figure that that out um, and you know so it again goes to the question which you know when I read 281 I, you know it's supposed to collaborate or it's supposed to you know conduct investigations and, and you know I would prefer given that we have like the Vermont State Police you know have, have really spent what over a decade working on this problem that there are best practices out there and I'd rather see this panel working on identifying those best practices and ensuring that every state agency um, adopts a practice that's best suited for them rather than going after various state agencies um, to identify systemic racism and you know basically slap them on the wrists. Say. So John, you see the police as investigating themselves? No, I, the other no I was the using the state thing. police as a good model a best practice for how to address but they are systemic. investigating internally. Well, they, they do have an internal affairs. I mean, they're a law enforcement agency. I mean, uh, you know. But they do go to the AG if they find an issue, right? Absolutely. But what they're doing is probably more serious than any other mm -hmm. state agency. Is it in, if they arrest somebody, and, you know, for criminal conduct, that person could go to jail. I mean, whereas, you know, other state agencies, you know, systemic racism may be more of an employment issue. Somebody doesn't get hired, somebody doesn't stay as long. As, so, <coughs> just fine. Really? Yes. What the lieutenant went through was their entire internalized program to root out uh, implicit bias and that sort of thing. Right, and it was very proactive. Yes, there is the internal affairs part of it if something goes wrong, but the yeah. part I was more interested in was the, the number of proactive steps they're using to train you know, senior management, middle management, mm -hmm. and, and the officers who are on the road you know, conducting traffic stops. On an ongoing basis. Right, and I, I thought that was very valuable, could serve as a, a you know, you know, you can learn a lot from that best practice and, and adopting those practices across the state in, in various agencies, I think, is a good thing to do. So that's one of the questions we have to, to deal with is, is do we want to be proactive and use a collaboratory model or do we want to use an investigative model where we're sort of identifying problems? And if I could add, in addition to the state police, going back to Curtis Reed's testimony, um, he cited not only uh, the state police in terms of the Department of Public Safety, he also said that commerce, transportation, tourism, and fish and wildlife have best practices that they've been employing and stand out as, as models that could be um, used in terms of sharing best practices with other agencies. Well, we may want to look at the statement policy in, in the state police. He must have a policy statement. Well, I mean, I think, you know, that's one thing that this panel and chief officer can start doing is, is creating an inventory of best practices mm -hmm. in the state, you know, because I think that's one of the things to do. Um, so, I mean, that too would go along with, remember Curtis Reed did suggest that if we stick with this bill, mm -hmm. that we have a new number one as to their tasks. And it was because it, Mr. Reed was very upbeat. He was the glasses already <coughs> yes. three quarters full, he said, mm -hmm. in terms of um, status with, uh, within the state agencies regarding uh, rooting out uh, systemic racism. Um, he said we should have a new number one that points out the good things that are going on, which gets to an inventory of best practices already and in, 
an inventory of best practices already being employed in these various right. state entities. And I think as Rob said, I mean, you know, if you have an officer, a chief officer who's an activist, who, whose main function is to basically say, got ya, mm -hmm. to various state agencies, this isn't going to be a collaborative approach. And mm -hmm. it's really not going to um, resolve any of the systemic racism that exists among state agencies. It could make things worse. It could. One thing, we, somebody around the table mentioned the test is, you know, we could, it, we'll see if, if, we, if we put the imprimatur on this and, and uh, move forward this, this panel with the chief officer, whatever name it would have, that we'd, there would be a time period in which it would be shown, does it work or doesn't it work? And it's built right into the bill, frankly, because of lack of funding. It either lives or it doesn't. Not unlike the Ethics Commission, unless it's, <clears throat> unless proactive action is taken to maintain it down the road, goes out of business. Um, but, but, Bryn, coming back to you, yes. is there other information <coughs> you can give us? with regard to the concerns raised by the AG's office. Sure, so I would just point out that nothing, um, in terms of the confidentiality concerns um, regarding data that would be, or records that would be turned over to the chief, there's nothing in S-281 that would compel the disclosure of records that are subject to confidentiality requirements. So for example, um, private or you know personal health information um, is subject to federal law. It would have to be redacted prior to being turned over. Um, with that said, I think that there it would be it would be quite easy to put in some language that would require uh, that would that would say that all of the records disclosed to the chief or turned over to the chief um, would be exempt from the Public Records Act. It's, that's that's easy to add. But I think that um, first of all, records um, because the because the bill contemplates uh, an overview of institutionalized racism. I think the idea was that personal because it, the, this chief wouldn't be targeting individuals, that um, the records that would be turned over would not necessarily be personal records, mm -hmm. but also if, they, if mm -hmm. records were personal, that they would be redacted prior to being turned over. However, it would be easy to do a belt and suspenders um, provision here to provide for confidentiality. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, can you, can you explain to me uh, when, if we're looking to give this person subpoena powers, or this position, subpoena powers, um, break that down a little bit for me as far as uh, what, what they would be able to get versus what they wouldn't. I mean, we heard testimony this morning that the Human Rights Commission has got access to information that um, even the folks that that information's about don't have access to. You know, if we take the example that they used about the state hospital, could you give me a rough idea what that would look like, potentially? Well, because the bill at the outset contemplates um, collaboration between the agencies and the position, I think that the, it was contemplated that there would be some collaboration at the outset. If an agency didn't comply with a request for information, then the position could use its subpoena power. Um, to demand that the agency or department turned over information. Um, the scope of that information, I think, is, uh, is not, certainly not laid out precisely in the bill. Um, the way that subpoenas typically work is that the court exercises that, um, the, court role, the court's role is to sort of arbitrate the, uh, the inquest that permits the state to investigate. Um, in a manner that doesn't infringe on the liberties of the witnesses. So the court would, you know, um, if an agency were issued a subpoena and they wanted to quash the subpoena, that would go to court. And the court would decide whether or not um, the, that demand for records was appropriate. So I, I'm sorry. So, no, go ahead. I just, the question I had yesterday mm -hmm. just hit my head. <laughs> go ahead. Um, do you have to be a member of the bar, an attorney, to issue a subpoena? 
I believe you do, but I would, I would. Or a notary. Oh, thank you. <laughs> or, or, or something as simple as just being a notary. I mean, I'm. Yeah, really? but it's normally an attorney or the court will issue them itself. Okay, I'm going to a notary. So, one, one of the issues that concerns me about the subpoena power in this bill is it just sort of sits there. And, 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 and what and is you don't understand why it's there because and I'm going to go to H eight six eight which you know talks about the powers of the, the Human Rights Commission. So okay, they have subpoena power too, but then you go to the next section of the bill: enforce concili conciliation agreements and prohibitions against discrimination, temporary or permanent injunctive relief. The imposition of a civil penalty of not more than ten dollars, compensatory and punitive damages on behalf of aggrieved individuals, and, and it goes on from there, which is very much like an enforcement action process, which is what I did when I was at the SEC. Um, it, whereas that language doesn't exist in, in 281. So, you know, at least based on my experience, it, there's something missing from the bill if we're going to go down that path. Now. I think we should take a collaborative approach, but, and that's why I'm not exactly sure why that's in there, why the Senate put it in there, and obviously Britain can't really address that question, um, but it's something that I know I want to, to at least find out from the Senate as to why that language got into the bill. Is that overreach? Is that what you're thinking? I, I, no, I just, it's just like, it's plunked into the middle of the bill. And it's like, okay, you're issuing subpoenas. Well, in my experience, that's leading to some sort of legal action, mm -hmm. which is like bringing a criminal action, bringing a civil action. So that would normally come from the AG's office? No, it could come from this group, sort of, but you don't have the, the, the language in the bill to do any of those things. Mm -hmm. But it is in 868. That language, well, that it's part. Of language it's part of. It's, it's in eight six eight because it's part of the existing statutory language for the Human Rights Commission. But th that's why I'm saying I'm trying to compare the two. Is okay, you know, HRC has subpoena power, but here's what they're going to do when they start subpoenaing people. And I have the question I wanted to throw out there: Do we need to keep the subpoena piece in there if indeed it's contemplated that? People are going to play nice together. And any lawyer or notary could subpoena anyway. Well, no. Without it. Well, no. If you pull the language out, it would be out. So it would take it away from. from that person wouldn't have the authority without. And if you put it inside the Human Rights Commission. Well, if you put it in that way. Well, you would have it because it already exists. Okay. And you would also have, and this is one of the things I said to think about the, the HRC versus you looked at it. Read the 868 and what they can do. Okay, so it just depends on what type of model you want. Collaborative. The bottom of page five is where I see it. See, I go back to the collaborative, which you've spoken mm -hmm. about, okay, and some others have also in here. The subpoena, the, having the subpoena thing in there seems to me to run counter, like a battering ram, uh, mm -hmm. to collaborative. And that's what Beth Bastini testified to. She said subpoena power is going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So for, at least from the administration standpoint, I'm just pointing that out. Right. Not taking a position, per se, but seems like a hammer. But, but if we keep it in, we need, to, in the event that some agency out there right. says, and talk to the hand. We're not talking to you. And one of the things there needs I, to be some right. how exactly. it goes from there. Because that's one of the things I talked with Rin yesterday on. It was just like, it sort of just, as I just explained, it sort of just sits there and it's like. It's kind of a hammer. Well, no, but it's start of a hammer. It's start of a hammer, but the HRC powers, that's the hammer. When you can bring an injunctive action, you know, seek civil and punitive, you know, fines, that's the hammer. I mean, let me throw out this other possibility. If we go back to the composition of the panel, we're talking about the Ed model, the agency of Ed model. If, for instance, the people on the panel are appointed by the governor, they provide names from which the governor has to choose the the, um, the officer, that head officer, whatever he or she is called, 
um, if there were an agency out there that wasn't behaving itself properly, you know, not doing, not responding well to the uh, inquiries of this entity that had in and of itself been appointed by the governor, theoretically, can't the governor say, agency such and such, this is what's expected of you, and have that kind of conversation, which isn't an easy conversation. People leave their jobs um, if they don't go along with what their boss says. I, I'm just throwing that out there. Isn't that well, another, right. possi and another and possible way of looking at this? If, we're, if we take um, Dana Wall's testimony about working on putting in performance measures, if an agency is not meeting its performance goals, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a problem. And, and the, 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 you would assume that the, the governor or someone in the administration would brings that hammer would down. Which say something. Kind of hammer. Yeah. We've got lots to talk about, and we're far from done. <laughs> but Bryn's done with us, right? For, for the moment. I think so. Is there, yes. or was there other, were there other? Um, Did you have other pieces coming out of the, that conversation I, regarding the AG? I think that the only other piece was about the data collection. Yeah, Thank you. And this data, collecting your data, and then this operations, uh, operational Operation priorities. So it's page five and page four. Okay. Um, so the collection of data, I think that um, what was contemplated by manage and oversee the statewide collection of race-based data, I think what was contemplated was organizing it, managing it, and overseeing the existing collection of race-based data. There is data is being collected currently. And I think that it's been the testimony probably in here and other committees that there's no centralized platform for that data. There's nobody overseeing to ensure that it's being collected. Um, there's no place to access it. So I, my understanding of the Senate's intent there was to um, manage and oversee the current the data that's being collected currently and not to branch out into new areas. But I agree that um, if it were, if the intent were to collect additional data, that would need to be made more clear about specifically what data that would be. Okay. Anything else, Brian, before you need to run to your next? I don't think so. I'm sorry, that I, I'm sorry that I have to go. But. No, no. You've given us a great deal It's been, it's of been a joy. <laughs> 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 right. We'll be back. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, committee, we, um, other aspects of this that we've heard about so far that you want to touch on at this point, understanding this is part of a much longer conversation. We're making no decisions about anything. We're just putting ideas out on the table. There's fodder trying to, um, well, do our due diligence to bring out the best bill we can. <coughs> So, Jessica, I think that last point that we just heard from is another the two, the that we need to sort of talk about, which is do we want a centralized platform, and then balancing that with do we want a needs assessment that's done in the community, and then of course what goes along with both of those conversations is funding. So, but anyhow, those we keep kind of going between the two, and I think that we're going to have to decide if we want both or one or. <clears throat> Do we want a centralized platform for all the information that's already out there available to put in one place that's easier to digest? So that's the Act 54 data that's already been collected. Right. I would assume that's what it is, right? That's whatever's that's, here yeah, yeah. in this little section, which is 5003A. It's, it's whatever's been, it's been referenced by yeah. many different witnesses. That a whole bunch of data is already, it's already been out there, right. in the context of Act 54. Do we want to? Or what was the other part? And then or an and or, like an and slash or, the needs assessment, a real needs assessment by talking with the community about what's going on, and then taking Which that community? data. What community are you talking well, about? Well, that's a good question. It came up this morning, two, it, uh, two folks who testified um, who talked about a community assessment. And my thought is that this is similar to what the women's group did on the day's work, day's pay, which was a whole, you know, they went to a consultant who really did the research to see what is really going on for women in the 
world of pay. So it's that same sort of. But it's so. But it's still the community within state government. Right. I would say that it's talking to people who work in state government. It's more of the. Um, what's the word? Non-objective. More per, uh, perception as well as. Uh, reality for people, the individuals, in what, state how they're feeling, how, what they're, yes, in we're state government. With, right. we're, you're not suggesting that we expand the scope of this bill to, to the, the whole state. state. Right, no, staying within, state government. which would be the three branches. Three branches. Right. All three branches. Because it'd be curious, why is it that their turnover is so much um, higher among people of color than otherwise. So how do you get at that? You're not going to, I don't think you're going to see that in the regular data that's already out there. I think you have to do more to figure that out. Talk to more people. And Rob had something here. Uh, a couple of <coughs> when, <coughs> Trooper Scott, I forget his official title. Lieutenant. <coughs> Lieutenant. Didn't he indicate that there was only basically two sort of databases that law enforcement <coughs> was with? I think it was Valcor that and one was Spillman. Spillman. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it, that data should already be there that they're collecting. I would think that we sh should be able to compile the two. And the other question that I have is, in my former life, when I had employees leave my employee, especially when I worked for a Fortune 100 company, we had to do what was called exit interviews. And I'm curious to know if, if those are being done as to why people are leaving. And my, my sense of it is, is that we, we don't do those or do a good job of them. We just look, okay, this is what our turnover is and this is who that yeah. number's comprised of, but we never really find out why. I mean, maybe it wasn't so much about the job as it was something else. Um, that's it, Madam Chair. That's Thanks. It. Anything else for the moment? Understanding we're coming back to this issue at 4 o'clock. Um, yes, sir. I, I just think, you know, one thing H68 does have it is a, a better sentence with respect to data collection, which is to create a strategy for implementing a centralized platform for race-based data collection and manage the aggregation, correlation, and public dissemination of the data. The, the other thing I want to raise is I've yet to hear any testimony as to what other, other data we need. You know, I asked Chloe White that question, you know, and she didn't have a quick answer for it. Um, and we heard for, from other people that there is, there is, the data's there. It just may be an issue of How do you find it? aggregating it yeah. so that it's useful to people. Yeah. And so the, we still need to resolve that. Well, Lieutenant Scott made a clear talk with him today that there is a lot more information that mm -hmm. comes even off of this report that isn't on this report. Right. That, mm -hmm. <laughs> do you want to let this be for the time being? Mm -hmm. We've got a mountain of issues within this bill mm -hmm. to work our way through. And we will do it. We'll make our way through. We always do. Okay? Just remember, we all have to keep breathing deeply. And remember, we're family around this table. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, you got an extra 15 minutes for lunch. Just so that you're aware, Trevor, Tre yeah, don't spend it all in one place, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, just so you know, Tre I had a, a message from Trevor Whipple, our police chief in yeah. South Burlington, and um, to call him at noontime, he has something to share with us with regard to S-192. That's the one that moves law enforcement uh, certification licensing to OPR and the issues that are in that bill. Uh, if you'll recall, I had agreed to put off having S-192 brought up again until this next week because everybody was trying to do a kumbaya thing, not only within law enforcement, but law enforcement with OPR. Um, I do have it on our schedule for next week because they said they'd be ready. I hope to heaven <laughs> Trevor's not pulling the rug out there, from underneath there, that. There yes. was something in the Secretary of State's update this morning on that, it sounded like they did some um, S-192 law enforcement, various law enforcement folks have 
oh. wavered on their support moving this to OTR after being convinced the licensing piece is unnecessary. Right. They, yes, um, they've they, had their kumbaya <laughs> moment and they're yeah. moving. Yeah. And they're, yeah, it sounds like it's kind of falling apart. Well, so we're still going to we're still going to take it up next you, week. You said Trevor wanted to talk at noon. I'm calling him at noon. Okay, I just wonder if maybe. Oh, we don't need to. No, it's not for the committee. Okay. He's okay. Gonna, he wanted to okay. talk to me. Yeah. No, you, don't worry. Lunch you, is you not. Can stay. You should be here. No, I just, I just thought he might be there if you want us to hear it. But no, that's all right. Okay. He didn't say the committee. Right. That's fine. Okay. If it does turn out, what I, Dennis, if it does turn out when I'm talking to him, that's something the whole committee needs to hear. I'll okay. arrange a different time. I don't okay. need to hear any more okay. than I'm hearing now, really. Uh, well, all right. Okay. All right. We're hot dog. We voted. This is bill number one, two, three, four, five. This is bill number 25. We have voted out of this committee this session. Yay! Mm -hmm. How many? 25. <coughs> this session. This session. We did 20 before crossover. Not easy carrying this group, mm -hmm. is it? It isn't. Whoa, yeah, we're a bunch of workers. Some tough ones coming up. <laughs> oh, the voice of doom. Yet to be heard. Um, so, now we, dear me, okay, now we need to switch gears to S281. Look at that, it's the same numerals. 182 turns into 281. I'm not, I'm easily entertained at this hour. <laughs> That's rare. <laughs> <laughs> and you're pretty, pretty observant there, Matt. Yes, okay. So we're back to systemic racism. And we have two folks to provide testimony to us. And did, was Bryn able to come back? Well, maybe she will. Um, okay. Uh, are, are you. Um, supposed to be down in a committee meeting? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Chief, do you mind? No. Nope. Okay. Absolutely. Senator Brock, if you don't mind. <coughs> thank, thank, you thank you very oh, much. No worries. Yeah. And thank you for coming up a second time. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's uh, Senator Randy Brock, uh, and thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to come in and talk about S-281. It's a bill that, as you know, has gone uh, through the other body uh, with, with considerable debate. Uh, I uh, do have some concerns about the bill, uh, and uh, I had offered an amendment uh, on one particular section of the bill, which was not accepted uh, by, uh, by the Senate, but I do want to discuss that with you today. I have concerns about a number of areas of the bill, but probably the biggest concern that I have is related to the selection criteria uh, for members of the board on the one hand, and in particular, the requirement that a certain number of people uh, on that board be as defined persons of color. Now, the, the terminology, and I can think back my personal experience uh, over the number of years that I've been around, I've been called lots of things. <laughs> you know, there was a point in time when being called colored was being polite and politically correct, and then it became Negro, and then it became black, and now persons of color, and if I live a few more years, I hesitate to think what I'm going to be called then. We're now in an era of microaggressions in which now people who say little things that are considered politically incorrect and insensitive are ostracized and criticized, and a great deal of hurt seems to emanate from it. And to give you an example, uh, I was at the, the Maple Festival Parade uh, two years ago in St. Albans, and I marched in the parade, and as I was walking back to the beginning of the parade uh, along the parade route, because the parade was still en route, uh, a woman uh, on the sideline uh, called me over to shake my hand, and she said, I voted for you before, I'm going to vote for you again, and thank you, and so on and so forth, and elated. And then as I walked away, uh, she called out, by the way, you've got a really nice tan. <laughs> now, to some, that would be considered a microaggression. For me, I'm grateful I had a voter <laughs> and who I know did not say anything that she intended to be offensive in any way, nor did I take any offense to it. Uh, sometimes, and I know this is a politically correct statement, sometimes I think we have to lighten up and not be so concerned 
Now, it's not to say that there isn't real bias, that there aren't really egregious examples of racism uh, that we see from time to time in Vermont. There are. And those are things that we do need to, as a state to react against. And I think we've made uh, a considerable process, uh, amount of progress in doing that. Is it perfect? No. But you know, people bully people. People do offensive things. People make offensive statements to people not just for race, but for all kinds of reasons. It could be for obesity. It could be for intelligence. It could be for disability. It could be for a lot of things. All of those things uh, uh, are often addressed through uh, education, through remediation, through teachers uh, saying the right thing, for people speaking up when they need to speak up. Uh, and sometimes it needs the heavy hand of government, but, but not always. But in particular, what I found most objectionable about this particular bill uh, uh, is this uh, defined reverse racism, if you will, that says that a board to deal with this can only be composed of people who are distinct advocates. We don't have one. We're all excited about a bill. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did it come through yet? Right. Is we that yet or not? Yep, it's, it's, it's coming. If you can wait for it to print. Yeah, sure. Okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, that we are using a, a, a methodology that really is a, a form of racism to create a board that's supposed to be anti racist. Uh, you have, an, an ironically, on about the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's death, uh, I just remember those words that we should select people for things based on the content of their character and not the color of their skin. And to make an assumption that you have to have people of color uh, defined uh, on a board has the inherent assumption in it that they or we have some perspective or some unique commonality of view that is uh, essential uh, to be represented because, again, we're fungible and we all think alike. And that's not the case at all. I think it's ironic, too, that when you consider percentages, you know, if you talk about systemic racism, if you take a look at the number of African Americans in Vermont, which I think was 1.2, 1.3 percent, I'm pulling the number out, but I know, I know it was less than 2 percent based on the last census, and you compare the number in the Senate, for example, we represent approximately 6 percent of the Senate. So it's clear that either Senator Brooks and myself are going to have to resign in order to get the, the numbers back to where they ought to be. That's silly, isn't it? I think that we do have uh, organizations in place within state government that are fully capable of addressing what, and I don't want to minimize the seriousness of the problem or the issue that needs to be addressed. We have a Human Rights Commission, and one of the questions that has always been in the back of my mind as I've looked at this legislation is, why can't the charter of that be amended and expanded accordingly to deal with that? Because the issue of collecting data and analyzing it, presenting it and reporting on it, uh, and making recommendations on it, is something that uh, is fully within the possibility of chartering the Human Rights uh, Commission to be able to do. And it's also an organization that is already staffed, perhaps inadequately. Uh, but uh, the notion of adding staff, uh, probably at a cost lower than that that's envisioned here, is, not, is, is I think, a very realistic idea. Uh, I'm also concerned about uh, the structure of, of the committee in terms of what it's supposed to do. Uh, we've allocated from a cost standpoint about $75,000 in this bill to deal with the first year, but if you just read the items that, the, that the, this committee is supposed to do, this is going to be a significant cost going forward that we're legislating in law without understanding what the real cost of this is going to be. And if they have to hire consultants and do other kinds of things to do these things, uh, clearly this is not a one-time cost issue uh, of a single staff person. The separation of powers issues concerns me. Uh, because what we're doing is we're creating what essentially is a cabinet level position. We're housing it in the agency of administration and then charging them with providing legal and logistical support with no budget to do that. So the question is, how's that going to be paid for? And the, the bill is silent on that. Uh, there are uh, a, a, a number of other issues. In particular, I'm concerned about the subpoena power. 
speed of power that is given this position, I think, is unusually broad and unusually concerning. If you take a look at the subpoena power uh, granted to the Human Rights Commission, it's limited. There are reasonable time frames for response. There are protection for the individuals being subpoenaed. There none of that is contained in this particular law. If you take a look at the rules uh, in Vermont of civil procedure and criminal procedure, again, there are fences around uh, subpoenas, the use of subpoenas, and the ability of people being subpoenaed to, uh, uh, to, to come back and, and, and have redress. There's none of that in this bill. This power, at least as I read it, has the ability to send you a, a certified letter and ask for your medical records, ask for your personnel records, ask for intimate things involving your family, and you've got to respond to it within six days. And there's no notice. There's no, the, the period that you would have, even if you want to challenge that in court, is unreasonably short. And that is a, a concern to me as to whether an individual who is appointed by a, a, a board that's appointed by a bunch of folks that's not answerable to anybody who's in elected office has that kind of power. I think that's very concerning. And I think that should concern all of us. Uh, I could go on about other things that concern me about the bill, but uh, in particular, uh, I would ask you to <coughs> think carefully that if you are going to go through uh, with this, that you use language uh, regarding the appointment that is, that is, in, that is, is inclusive and that is non-discriminatory in nature, and that you make that clear. So I think, uh, otherwise, I think you have uh, a, a real constitutional issue, and I understand the Attorney General's office has, has been in and spoken with you about it, so I, I won't attempt to repeat, because I know there were a number of things that they raised concerns about, and I, I would just mention to you that, that, that I share those concerns. It's not that we don't have a problem that needs to be dealt with. I think we do have a problem that needs to be dealt with. I think that this, though, is a very blunt instrument to do it with. We've got Dennis and then Jim. So uh, thank you for coming in and, and giving your statement. So uh, when you presented the amendment on the, uh, on the floor of the Senate, and, uh, and it was voted down, I guess, 18 to 12, mm -hmm. could you give uh, me the gist of the argument for leaving it as it was, was there not time to consider the amendment, or did they just... No? Well, I think that by the time you know, the bill was, was up for consideration, that the, uh, the, the Government Operations Committee in the Senate had had it, and they had heard from all the advocates who were supporting it. I don't know that they heard from anyone who did not support it. I'm not sure that they heard from the Attorney General's office at all. And uh, as a result, I, I think there was a, a very single view uh, that uh, this is something that they thought was important that they wanted to do. And uh, uh, I think a number, of, I, think it's, it's, I think it's interesting to note that the only two African-American members of the Senate both voted against it. And that may be a clue. Thank you. Thank you. Jim. <coughs> Senator. Um, I, I, I appreciate um, your sense. I mean, you've had multiple roles. You've been state auditor, so you've been part of, you know, the government structure, and obviously you've served as a state senator for, for some time. Um, you, you talk about, yes, we do have a problem, we, and we need to work towards, you know, making it better. Um, we had some discussion earlier today. Is it... Do we, do we try initially more of a collaborative approach to you know, educate folks, or do we need some enforcement <coughs> mechanism which could involve the Human Rights Commission to have some teeth behind it if, if they needed to use that? I think HRC tries very hard to do a collaborative approach mm -hmm. as well. Or, or is it better served within state government as you know advising the governor on uh, issues or concerns within state government uh, and doing some of the data analysis to see you know, if, if that's a way to measure. Well, I think the, the issue of, of, of defining the problem and data and, and the collection of good data and the analysis of good data, and, and I emphasize that good data is important uh, because you, know, you can get all the data in the world, but if you interpret it incorrectly or if the data gives you a bunch of numbers but it doesn't really answer questions, that too is a problem. And the one thing that, that I would emphasize about a lot of the data that I've seen is that correlation does not equal causation. 
because you see a disparity, it doesn't mean that it was caused by a particular set of conscious actions or discriminatory actions unless you go beneath the data and you ask yourself what other things might be going on. And of the data that I've seen thus far, uh, it begins to touch on it. Say so some of the police stop studies begin to touch on it, but there's an absence of some key data elements that would shed, I think, a lot more light on it. If we look at uh, the, the, the incarceration population, again, as an example, um, and, and you ask yourself, gee, the, that number, there's a tremendous disparity there. But you've got to, in my mind, get beneath the numbers and ask, well, why is that disparity? And if you say to yourself, who are the people who were incarcerated, and do they differ uh, between groups and uh, uh, that uh, of, of inmates who are incarcerated, for example. And if, to take as an example, if you have uh, uh, a, a small group of people who uh, have prior felony convictions and who uh, grew up in an area that is high crime, you would have an expectation that they have a higher likelihood of being incarcerated than someone who came up uh, in with a no criminal background and who came from an area that had a low crime rate. And I'm not sure that any of our studies of incarceration rate have actually looked at that and, and broken down the other kinds of demographic clues that could explain things or at least raise issues. Uh, racism may in fact be the issue. Systemic racism may absolutely be the issue. But there also may be other issues. And I don't think our data analysis has been sophisticated enough uh, uh, are focused enough to, to deal with that. And that's why I think, for example, some of the kinds of uh, the, the issue of data analysis I think is very important. But that data analysis, as I read the tone of the bill, I get the distinct assumption that the conclusions are already drawn as opposed to a clear independent analysis. And that, I think, again, is something that, that concerns me. When I look at the uh, composition of the board as, de as the way it's defined here, people who have involved, been involved in racial justice uh, uh, programs, it strikes me that this limits the potential of the board to a small number of activists. And I don't know that that is going to give us the kind of objectivity that we need to give us all comfort that the result and the advice being given is, is both independent and credible. Other questions for the senator? Warren? Oh, I'll, I'll Warren. Go ahead, Warren, go first. Okay, and then Rob. Um, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, we, we heard quite a bit of concern about at least three members shall be persons of color. Mm -hmm. And the, the, what we heard is that's pretty blatantly unconstitutional. I believe it's blatantly unconstitutional as well. Yeah, so we're trying <laughs> to find, we're trying to find a better way to say basically that whole paragraph. Uh, we want people who understand the problem, uh, maybe have lived with the problem, uh, but we're somewhat at a loss. We have, we have this, we heard that who have had lived experience with systemic racism. Well, I guess that's the question, you know, of, of lived experience of what that what that really means, because. Every person who is a, quote, person of color, unquote, has a different experience. Right. The assumption, I think, here is that everybody has some common level of experience that, that, that causes folks to view it in a certain way. And I don't know that that's necessarily true. Right. Uh, I, the, the language that I use in my amendment, I don't know if you've seen the amendment that, that I proposed, I but the language basically said, takes that section out that relates to the appointment of the board and its composition and changes to read, in order to promote vigorous debate and a full exploration of the issues, panel membership shall reflect a variety of backgrounds, skills, experiences, and perspectives, be racially diverse, and represent geographically diverse areas of the state. All member appointments shall be made in a non-discriminatory manner. Now that's a second version. I had a version earlier than that that didn't include the racially and geographically diverse piece. Uh, I added that in the, the uh, item that I introduced uh, with it because it was clear that the Senate Government Operations Committee wanted something racial in there, and this was probably the least offensive way of doing it, and probably reasonably constitutional if you could argue that there was some purpose of having diversity. The one issue that I you know, would emphasize really in, in all of these discussions is that this is 
I think we have to be careful about diversity and that our focus should be on inclusion. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those two things wind up being in conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jessica? No, I'm good. I'm just okay. But that rug was uh, you know, uh, That's right. Darn it. Well, I'm sorry. Thank you, Dennis. And I have a sleep. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really that sincere, actually. Okay. <laughs> um, Randy, we, we've obviously taken a lot of testimony on this issue. Did, did you hear any testimony or do you have an opinion as to how large is this problem, the, the scope of this? We, we've heard that we have some systemic racism, but yet nobody's been able to sort of quantify it. Well, we know that it, at least as far as African Americans, it doesn't affect more than 1.3 percent of the population. <laughs> uh, in point of fact, though, seriously, uh, there, there are, you know, you, 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 you certainly see anecdotally uh, the uh, claims of, of problems that uh, have occurred in the criminal justice system. You see the issue of the disproportionate number of stops, which is yet unexplained, although data, better data may help explain some of it. Uh, you see the incarceration rate, and, and again, there may be explanations, but the, the, the percentage difference is so great that it's got to be of concern. You hear of the incidents uh, in the uh, uh, the, the state hospital and the complaints of employees. Uh, we've had a number of cases, law enforcement cases, of people who claim to have been assaulted or otherwise. Uh, those, so those do suggest, you hear uh, obviously uh, anecdotally, and much of this is anecdotal, of uh, people who say that their kids have not been treated equitably uh, in the school systems, a higher disciplinary rate. And that's an issue that exists all over the country. So, you know, all of that is, there, there are enough things there that say we do, we should be looking at them, and we should be analyzing, we should be understanding them. We know that education about what is and is not offensive is, is, is an important issue, but that also is a charge that's already given to the Human Rights uh, Commission. And so to the extent that, that it's contained here, it's frankly, it's duplicative. Uh, and that again is another question is, you know, are we, you know, we have a body uh, that perhaps has a capability of doing it and certainly may need additional resources to do it, but shouldn't we be using that and yet creating another body that appears to potentially be in conflict with it? Um, so I, I hope that answers, yeah, at least begins to answer your question. Yeah, thank you. Any other and questions? And I would add, and I know that the yeah. Chief's going to talk about it as, as well, is that when we talk about people of color, uh, largely the folks who come have been African American, but there are other people of color in Vermont. Uh, we, we certainly have a disparate rate of stops regarding Hispanic uh, individuals. We have uh, certainly uh, the, the Native American uh, folks who uh, have different issues, and, and we certainly have Asian Americans who, uh, and I remember there was a point in time, I don't know, it was back in the 70s or so what, in which uh, African Americans actually earned more than white Americans in Vermont, so times, times can, can change. <laughs> I just was curious what you thought about. We heard from, um, and I can't, Curtis, I can't remember. His Curtis, name. Curtis. Right. Yeah, and yeah, Curtis. one of the things mm. that was interesting about his testimony was that um, this could really help us with our economic issues around attracting folks mm. to work here and vacation here and so forth. And um, I'm just curious what you think about that. I think if we are able to do a good job with what we do, that people would feel more comfortable being sure. here. Sure. I mean, there, there, there's certainly a, a market uh, to, to attract people to, to, to Vermont uh, for, for a variety of reasons. And I think it's one that we should try to exploit. And by, by, by quotes, having that, setting that good example uh, and having good uh, progress in these areas is important. I, I think the progress, for example, that we've made uh, between the state police uh, in particular, who I think have done a very, very good job of addressing this problem head on instead of fighting it, uh, which you see in, in some law enforcement agencies throughout the state, I think is a, is a very positive thing. And the Agency of Transportation has recognized that there may be some problems and they've dealt with them uh, openly. And it's, it's, it, it's doing that throughout state government without being forced to. Uh, that's the thing that's, that's just most positive about all of this. And uh, I, I don't want to uh, subsume uh, the good things that have been done and are being done with a cloud that, you know, we, we've got to impose this rigid regime uh, 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 that is 
made up of people who are activists in the area, uh, and, and uh, it, it, it appears quite heavy-handed and unnecessary. Thanks. Other questions for the senator? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <coughs> Senator, if you email me, you were in Thank you. Thank Oops, you. I'm sorry. Chief, uh, Chief Stevens. Yes. <laughs> Formal welcome, please. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. And if you could just relax until yeah. Dennis. Oh, people keep it's okay, we're all good. So um, if you could identify yourself for the record. Yes, uh, I'm uh, Chief Stevens. I'm, uh, well, Don Stevens, Chief of the Nulhegan Band of the Cusack Abenaki Nation. And um, I'm coming here not as a victim, but as a proud representative of our nation, our Indian nation. Because too many times people are always trying to pursue themselves of a victim of something. Uh, and always blaming problems on somebody else or why somebody else is oppressing them. And we don't kind of take that view. Uh, not to say that, you know, we haven't had our land taken and we didn't survive the eugenic survey and, and we didn't become legally extinct by the Judiciary Committee <laughs> uh, a long time ago by the AG, um, but uh, legally, legally extinct. Because in order to be an Indian, you have to be a recognized citizen of a, of a recognized tribe. So we can't just self-declare. So uh, that's, that's some of the concerns that I have here is that we, we have been in Vermont since before Vermont was Vermont. And we've had a lot of issues and we are disadvantaged. Even myself, I've lost jobs because of when, I, when they found out that I'm Native. Uh, just because of some of the conflicts other Native people have had in the past uh, trying to promote their identity, like the fish ends and the other, you know, the license plates that Homer used to drive around with. But, um, but, but I'm saying is so, so, you know, we've always taken a different tack that we'd rather be a partner with the state of Vermont than trying to be an adversary. Um, and it's kind of, I want to touch on a little bit of what Randy was saying, but in a way, the word color, like he was saying, we get lateral racism because of the lack of color, um, because we mix with French. People don't realize, would you think of me as a minority if you were looking at me or you were talking about um, uh, Abenaki people? You wouldn't, right? But in 2006, you passed a law identifying us as an ethnic minority in the state of Vermont, which is protected as a minority. So. Part of our, the issue of what I'm finding with this whole, uh, there should be uh, so many people of color, is that the way business works is the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And we don't have a national, um, we don't have national organizations like the AACP and all these things that can pay for us to consistently lobby you to be able to put us in a position where we can push our agenda, right? I'm not saying there's not problems, but I'm saying is the Abenaki people often get lost in, in the crowd, and, that, and that's very frustrating. I've had a bill in, this, in the House for three years to create a position in state government to deal with Native American affairs outside of the commission, but where we can have the Department of Education teach about us, because ignorance is formed on, on on not being educated about something, right? So if somebody is educated about something, then they're not as fearful and they're more apt to accept you, right? So, you know, we want to be in the schools teaching. We want social economic uh, relief for our uh, citizens. We do want Indian Health Services, which is through the federal government that we don't tap into as a state of Vermont. Uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of funds and stuff out there that we don't the state does not look at us. So in in 2011, you guys took the bold step of recognizing us as Indian tribes. And when you did that, you, you, you created a government-to-government -government relationship with our tribes. Because Indians create, have a special status when it comes to minorities, is that if you look at any federal or state governments, you, we have a government-to-government -government relationship with the state of Vermont by recognizing us. Federal tribes have a government-to-government -government relationship with the federal government. So. 
we are considered sovereign in the state of Vermont, even though whatever you put in the bill that we don't afford any other opportunities with other citizens in Vermont. That is, it, there's still a fiduciary a responsibility to have a government-to-government -government relationship. That's why you created the Commission on Native American Affairs. And that's why to deal with the same thing that's in this bill. And you know where that's gone? Nowhere. Because we haven't had funding. We haven't had we haven't had the people to actually, you guys could come and say, hmm, I wonder how the Native people feel about this. And then it would give you a, a place to go to talk to someone, right? So I'm not, I, I'm saying is, is that creating this this bill, there's a lot of issues that I have. I, one, I'm afraid that the same thing's going to happen because there is a sunset date on this. So nobody that works for a living would be able to apply for this job because it's only maybe guaranteed to be five years if you're lucky if you weren't removed by the board. <laughs> for so so one, <clears throat> unless you're independently wealthy, you couldn't you couldn't apply for this position and know that you would have a job after five years. Um, so that eliminates a whole bunch of people that might be that have a lot of input. Uh, the other thing is the putting a certain number of people on the board and who are, who's that going to be, the people of color. I know I want a, a representation for our citizens because, like I said, we can't promote to have other our race come to Vermont. We're, we're in Vermont. We're, we're, if, <laughs> we're distinct here, right? We can't add people to Vermont unless they're giving birth to them, uh, you know, so, so my, my big issue is frustration that you guys really did a great thing to, to, to promote us, accept us as a minority, but then you dropped off the face of the earth and, and, and we've been out in the wings doing stuff on our own. And all of these committees, like I'm on the state police fair and diversity thing, it's on my own time. I don't have anybody paying me to go to these committees and commissions. I took vacation time today to come here. Uh, because we don't have a representative that can be here for our <coughs> interests. So, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that there are, I know my history. I know about me. Part of the thing I see about this bill is how are you going to ensure that you're going to teach about me accurately and you're going to assess the needs of my community accurately because you don't know us, you don't know our issues, and you don't know our history. We do. That's the same thing with maybe an African American community, uh, uh, Vietnamese, uh, Chinese. How is this one officer going to be doing this? Because policies and laws don't mean a thing when it comes to disadvantaged people. You have so many federal laws on the books to protect against anti-discrimination. You have a lot of policies, an EEO uh, of non-discrimination. Do they work? They do some. They're, they're helpful, but really it's the mindset that you have to change and the education piece because nobody's going to tell you I discriminated against this guy and didn't hire him because he was native. They're going to say, oh, he wasn't qualified, right? So. So what you really need to do is, I know one native person in the state government here that is a native person, I don't know if he actually acknowledges it openly, um, um, and he's a citizen of a tribe, and you probably know him as Jim Maslin. He is an Abenaki person that's part of the Kohosuk tribe. Okay? Didn't know that. Right? Didn't know that. Well, that's what I'm saying, because yeah. the lack of color. So we have, our citizens have two issues. We either can blend in because of the color, lack of color of our skin and go about our way and not worry about disadvantage, but then we lose our heritage and we go extinct because then there's no more Indians. Or we promote ourselves like myself and then you become disadvantaged and then you become discriminated against and laterally discriminated against too because people say, you don't look Indian. I'm like, what does an Indian look like? You know, or, or you know, those kind of things, or your fake fraud and one of them said, you go through a process in the legislature and see if you can prove yourself to House, Senate, uh, the governor, AG, and see if you get past a law passed saying who you are. I've proven myself, right? I got a card in my wallet to prove it. <laughs> no, but, but, I, but I'm saying that that's how ridiculous that, how far down that road that you can go where you can get about trying to protect people disadvantaged, right? We actually have to go through a process. <laughs> um, so I guess I, I'm frustrated that our bills have gone nowhere and that 
we have no representation in the state and city and, and, and any of the governments unless we do it ourselves. I'm hopeful that you guys could maybe make a change so that maybe we can. Maybe, maybe you charge the state departments to actually try to hire people that are qualified and then track on that, saying, look, you guys have nobody in the Department of Education teaching Native studies that are of Native descent, right? Okay, you hired two people. That's two more than we had before, right? The same thing with, you know, market it. And, and I hate the term when you guys saying, oh, we, maybe we could market this to outside so people would come here. Okay, people will see a 10% increase when Native people do events and activities at Echo Center. Uh, or, you know, okay, we can, we can market that. You, let's call the tourism department saying they have an Aki people are open for business. I, I'm just saying, see how that, you know, it's kind of like, let's not use it as a marketing tool. Let's do it because it's the right thing to do instead of um, using it for a specific purpose because it, it's a tough thing. And uh, I, I'm coming here with an honest heart, and, 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 and I've seen this happen with us in 2006 uh, when you passed the bill as a minority, and then in 2011 when you passed our recognition, which was the happiest thing in the world for us, that we were no longer extinct legally. Um, that, you know, let's, let's build on those and partner. We're doing a lot of great things. And we don't need to, to distract, because I look at these things as Band-Aid fixes. You know, it's like the mural issue that I'm dealing with in Burlington, right? No, what I'm saying is you don't have to tear something down to build something up. We're looking at it, we're just saying, look, we want equal representation. It's a beautiful piece of art, fine. <coughs> Make it be a beautiful piece of art, but we want, we want equal representation to get our culture out so people know who we are. And, and I'm not laying this all lightly because it is a serious issue, right? But don't create another policies, don't create more laws, don't create, use the tools, like some of what Randy was saying, work with the communities who are disadvantaged in the state, hire those people to help guide, to make the change. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I'm trying to put. You don't need, you can throw all kinds of laws you want on it, but it's not gonna change people's mindsets or make them hire more people or, okay, what is this data supposed to do? Where are they getting the data? I mean, how many people actually work with the Census Department to actually get an actual head count of how many Native people in Vermont? I mean, we have some, but, you know, look, look at where the demographics are. Look at, look at where you can put resources. I mean, I can tell you where my citizens are. They may not always declare it, you know, because you lose jobs and you do get Disadvantage. We got a child right now that got beat up and put in a hospital because he was he was native, and he, there were some slurs right before that happened. Now these is teenagers, but you know there's still after effects of that. Um, but we're out there promoting our culture as best we can without help, and we all we ask is a hand up. You know, not a hand out, but just to, just help us. And I think any ethnic. When I say ethnic minority or any people with disadvantage, that's all they want. They just want a shot. They just want not to have the doors closed on us. You know, but when you're forcing, I don't want this to become a campaign where somebody forces somebody to find something wrong or they can use it as a sledgehammer to make it being distasteful to people in Vermont. Because if you're charging them to find something and they don't come up with anything, you're gonna say they failed. But if they find something, then there's going to be reason to continue it and to keep pushing and to keep. Does that make sense? Because you're, you're forcing this bill is forcing them to find something wrong or else you're going to say nothing wrong. So they're going to be squeezing a lot of departments to do this. And I, I think there's a better way to partner or a better way to do it, if that makes sense. I, I hope I've expressed myself. Uh, um, in that way and, and please if you do pass this bill and you do something don't leave us behind because you know we our people are important too mm -hmm. it's not just people who have a lot of lobbying and, and can be here all the time and push for it I mean I'll, I'll use not nothing against uh, you know Black Lives Matter but how many Abenaki flags have you seen flying at the schools we have one Missisquoi 
but I, but that was just because that was volunteer. It wasn't kind of you know what I mean. There there are more than there are more there are a lot of disadvantaged people here that need to be made sure that they're uh, they're not forgotten. Any questions? Yes. Jessica, do you um, do you know what the numbers might be? Do you have an estimate of how many folks are Abenaki in Vermont? Yes, it depends on how you do it. If you want legal or unlegal. When I don't say illegal immigration, I'm talking about legal as an Indian. On our tribal roles, we have 1,500 citizens, and our roles. Mm -hmm. Now you, that's only ours. Missisquoi probably has similar, and then you've got El Nu and Kosak where less, right? Those are people actually subscribed on the roles that uh, are citizens, right? Um, there could be more. Just there's a lot of people that still don't want to, because there's a, still a lot of issues out there. Like I'll use my mother. They had 12 brothers and sisters. Probably five of them are on the rolls, and the other ones said, mm, "That's okay. We'll have family events," you know, because they don't want to deal with. Once you stick your hand out, then, and and my grandmother was on the eugenics rolls. I mean, she died in '94. Okay, you want to talk about people being disadvantaged, I mean, that's why I say, you know, our people were taken from here and brought to Europe, maybe not from Africa to here, but I'm, I'm not doing that in a disparaging way. I'm just saying is there was reverse issues. We all have issues, right? But I'm just saying is there's a lot more people, if you've been in, have a family that's been in New England for a long time, you probably got native blood somewhere, and there's a lot more people that can... I mean, and it's not just not Abenaki, there's Inuit, there's Lakota, there's uh, people, Mohawks. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I was talking about Indian Health Services. You guys really miss the boat when it comes to pulling in federal funds. I got Indian uh, Title VII Indian Education Funds and Orleans and North Country Supervisory Union that, uh, that helps all, native, all students, not just native people. We get an X amount of money per native student in the school and it goes to after school programs. The Siskoi's got them up in Franklin County. We can go statewide with that if we had the people in the time. Indian Health Service is a separate pool of money that's specifically for Indians. You've got a lot of people, even if not, you can't get it for state, but people from Akwesasne come to UVM. There's, that's, a, that's a trauma center, that's the closest one. You have Lakota, you have people that, that you have natives that are federally recognized that could pull in Indian Health Service funds. You have Health and Human Services. I got a grant for Community Service Block Grants. I have USDA grants that we pull in for, for I, I'm just saying is the state doesn't look at us as a partner to help pull in funds for the state who's always complaining they have none. Well, they, that's because they, but if they partnered with some of us, we're a little unique than it is for, for, for race. I mean, that's not always afforded to other races, but we're, we're kind of unique in that way that they are a special program set up for native people. Uh, and native tribes that we could partner with people if we only had full-time staff or a position that could work on those issues. So uh, I will uh, kind of drop my soapbox. Sorry. So just follow up quickly. Yeah. Do you ever use the do you know if any of your folks ever use the Human Rights Commission or see that as a resource for? Concerns. No, we talked to them twice when Robert used to be the head of, uh, Robert Appel used to be the head of it. He came to the commission. I spent two years on the commission when it was formed, and I was yeah. the chair of the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs, so I have a pretty pretty grasp, good grasp on on, uh, on things. Um, so, no, they've came twice, and they, like I said, they, they really don't look at us as a, people don't look at us as a minor. Like, even when I asked, do you look at us as people of color, and, you know, some of you guys are like, no, or a minority, because that's an inherent bias because we don't look that way. So people often exclude us, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm coming today because we don't want to be excluded again. Mm -hmm. um, that, but yeah. I, we would love to partner with them, but we we partner with anybody that's coming with a good heart that's willing to help our people um, if we have the time, money, and resources, obviously. And I find it interesting that when I used the word Indian one day at dinner at our house, my kids immediately said, Mom, you're not supposed to say that. You have to say Native Americans. Well, like I had created, and I was like, well, when I was growing up, we well, said it's not, Indian. It's not true, just to and correct the say, record, because yeah. um, you can call me almost anything if you come with a good heart, <laughs> right? Because people don't know, right? But if we are legally an Indian because in federal statute and laws, and including, you know, under the Bureau of Indian Affairs, in order to be a legal Indian, 
you have to be a citizen of a federally or state recognized tribe. So that is a legal term. We are Indians, according to the federal government. People try to be politically correct and say native to the Americas or Native American or Canada First Nations people or we're not really Aboriginal, those are Australian. Really, yeah, I mean, really, what does all that mean? It just means that, you know, we have a distinct race, we have a distinct culture and heritage. So just call me Don, you know, or Chief Stevens or whatever, uh, you know, just for politeness. But I, all that other stuff is noise, you know, it's noise. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and when you got the recognition in 2011, yep. I think that opened up opportunities mm -hmm. for for your, your group to. Uh, I think that maybe there was some federal money, some grant money, some opportunities that hadn't been there before. It, what it did was it, it established the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs that was in charge of dealing with issues relating to Native people, including health care housing, uh, education, um, the same thing that's in this bill. <laughs> uh, and, but it was an unfunded commission that only had to meet three times a year. And now they finally got at least a stipend. Before they didn't even have that. When I was on the commission, they had nothing. They didn't even have a stipend. You just came. Uh, and you know, so how much can you do? That's like sending your kid to the movies and say you gotta come up with 20 bucks for a popcorn and, and to buy the ticket. You know, he's going to stand outside and go, man, anybody got a five bucks? <laughs> you know, I need five bucks. You know, I mean, so realistically, you know, it, the, it, the great intent was there. And I can tell you, we have done a lot on our own. <clears throat> I was able to secure uh, a, a, from the federal government a, a, a permit to carry eagle feathers, which no other state tribe are allowed to do other than the Pan Apache. I worked two and a half years on that and changed the law in Vermont to be able to get a cultural permit in order to carry those things with the Fish and Wildlife Department. And in turn, the Fish and Wildlife Department just named a, a new wildlife management after area after our language. This, the new one in Lake Bombazine, it's called Botswana. So you guys have an exemption on, on eagle feathers because you know it's a federal offense. Or yeah, you can show me my permit. Not anymore. Right. Not for us. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> I just know that. Uh, yeah, I knew other um, So, so uh, that was a huge feat, and with no money, and we got some pro bono attorneys to help us with that. Um, but that's just to practice our culture. So, and and we're showing over at the gallery, the uh, T.W. Wood Gallery. Uh, we're having our Abenaki artist uh, exhibit, and we had it at the Flynn. There. This is the good stuff you guys can hear about, that after you do something, that something positive has come out of it. And by doing that, it opened the doors up for people so we didn't have to be vetted in <coughs> right? I work with the Confederacy, the Wabanaki Confederacy. I work with the Mohawks. The, uh, I work with uh, the Mi'kmaq and the Penobscots. And we, we all do, we had the, the Wabanaki Confederacy in Shelburne in 2015. We brought all the nations from New England there. Uh, so I mean, and it's opened up the ability for our citizens to sell as Native American, which brings the price up. It allows us to apply for these grants. We have one kid right now that's going to full scholarship at Dartmouth College because they are now a legal Indian, and Dartmouth was founded on educating Native people. So those have opened it up, but we've all done the scratch and the clawing to make that happen on our own without any support. And that's why I'm saying is if you're going to support this bill, support us. We've been here. Um, begging, well, I don't say begging, but we've been here asking, uh, you know, for a long time, and we finally achieved it, so don't drop us off in the, in the, in the black hole because somebody else has a louder voice. And, uh, but what you guys do are important, and it does affect an entire race of people, and it was positive for us. I don't know if this will be positive, uh, because it could be, it could leave some bad taste in people's mouths if you start shoving it down their throat. I don't know. Uh, with the subpoena, like you're saying with the subpoenas and forcing them to comply. Well, when you force somebody to do something, a lot of times people tell, I don't, or they make me do it, or you know, I mean, it's like a kid. You tell him to go do something, he'll really grudgingly do it, but it doesn't make a, a good working relationship later on, right? So there'll be backlash, even if it's unconsequential, that you may not be aware of. So partner, work with people, uh, and 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 make it. Measurable. In other words, say, look, we're, we care about diversity. I want to work with the Department of Labor. Let's see that we've hired so many Native people. Let's see that we've hired so many people of color. Let's see, okay, we had 
that's what I'm, the state police are doing a great job. I mean, they recognize the issue. That I'm, the, we just had a meeting at the Vermont Law School that their numbers this year are better than they were last year. Uh, in 2017, that they've actually had less profiling and they've, they've had, you know, it, it's been a positive thing because they've been educated about, but there's also responsibility on minorities, including ours, not to perpetrate that stereotype. We gotta work a little extra hard not to think people that all we care about is gambling and booze, right? Just like they gotta make sure that other races don't say, well, they're just drug they're all running drugs, right? I mean, we have a responsibility ourselves <coughs> not to perpetuate that stereotype. Mm -hmm. But the Vermont State Police is doing a great job and and, and that's partnering partnering with our communities to, to make that change in a positive way. Other questions for the chief? Thank you very much. For well, thank you, and I, and I hope you. I was a help. And uh, you've given us a lot to think about and to try and figure out in, in the context of the bill. Yes, yes, and I, you know, and I know you guys have a tough job, and uh, you do your best. And but like I said, we know what we need if you if people partner with us. Uh, we just need the resources to do it. Um, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. If you get a chance, go look at our exhibit over yeah. at TW yeah. Window Gallery. It's, it's there now. Huh? It's for a month. Yeah, I made this. This is part of the spare claws and bone. So this is part of our artistry that we can now sell. It's Native American made. Yeah. My that, that was one thing that came. A very small school in Maine called Unity, and her one of her professors had the largest collection of Abnaki baskets oh. ever. Uh -huh. Great. I'd like just to thought know. I'd let you yeah, know. Yeah, I'd like to know where they are. Just in touch. Just as a side note, I mean, this is how serious the legislative people in Maine, they actually have two legislative positions that are strictly for Native people that, to weigh in on Native issues. Not that we would ever do that here, but I'm just saying is that they've gone, you can't tell me there's not open positions in state government or a department within the state government that they couldn't hire somebody to help. I'm reminded that the 2011 recognition allowed us to start selling, to start selling things. And it, it was, it was a, yeah, but the big opened the door. The biggest misconception, though, is that the Lenape, right? They they get the biggest grant. They're state recognized tribe only. They get the biggest amount of funds from the federal government for from HUD for housing, bigger than federal tribe state. They they concentrated on just getting HUD money because it's eligible for, and they and that they're the biggest receiver of of federal funds for housing. Wow. Um, I, there's there's opportunities. We just don't have the resources to apply for them. I got three small grants, but I can only manage so many. <laughs> you know what I mean? But anyway. Huh? Yeah, it's hard to manage a grant. A lot oh, of plus when you work. Yeah. I spend probably yeah. another 40 hours after work dealing with Native issues. Because mm -hmm. you have to understand, every federal project that has federal money requires Section 106. Uh, Sign off, which is Native American tribes for the na the protection, the Native uh, American Protection Grades Act. Every hydroelectric plant that's being relicensed in the state of Vermont, the Northern Pass project, the Vernon nuclear power, the Yankee, you've probably seen El New is involved in that. Every federal project that has federal mo money has to come across my my computer to, wow. to say, are you interested? We don't have time for every <laughs> single. It's like if you find a body, let us know. <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously. I mean, I mean, it sounds bad, but I mean, it's true, right? That's slower project now. Yeah. It does. <laughs> well, we have to leave on a late note, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Coach, will you want to talk about the Coach, you wanting to talk with us as a committee, or are you no, no, I. I uh, in between this and the next hearing, because we, we have a hearing at 5.30. Oh, that's right, you got minimum wage. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll be in touch. So, I'll be <laughs> what did you just Great. say? Thank you very much. <laughs> Likewise. Great. Back at you. <laughs> That was awesome. That very was much so. Fabulous. He's very And how do we, we've yeah. got to figure out yeah. 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 We've got to remember that as we continue working on this. I know Michelle Caseso was one of the big pushers 
uh, in 2011, co-sponsoring yeah. the bill. I think it went to general. He spoke to it on the House floor. Not important to us for Swanton, Shelburne area. 